Hi, welcome to this regular school committee meeting of December 14th, 2023. I'd like to welcome our AEA representative, Julie Keyes, our school, uh, Arlington High School <coughs> representatives, Amy Colario and uh, Graham Minnick. And uh, with that, we will move on to public participation or public comment. So before I open public comment, I want to read a statement. Um, I would like to apologize to the committee and the community for my misstep at our last meeting, especially, actually there were a few missteps. First, I didn't have my opening blurb on hand, the paragraphs I usually read before public comment giving direction and guidelines. Instead, I ended up winging it with less clarity than I would have liked. Second, during the public comment that issued, I allowed comment that in retrospect, I should have stopped. In the moment, I did this because I thought it was what was required after the Spalding v. Nagdick ruling. Part of the discussion included in this ruling talks about how comment cannot be disallowed because of its content, even if it identifies personnel. Since that time, I've tried to contact town council to get a better understanding of what should happen. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to connect with him yet, so instead I've been reading and rereading and rereading the Spalding v. Nadick decision and some discussions about what this means. What I've realized is that my understanding of the implications of the ruling were incorrect. Additionally, I know now that our, the, our policy BEVH has not yet been updated to be in line with this ruling. The MAS model policy has been updated this year and it makes it more clear what we can and can't allow for public comment. Uh, it reads in part, topics for discussion should be limited to those on those items within the school committee's scope of authority. The authority of the school committee primarily concerns the review and approval of budget of the district's public schools, the performance of the superintendent, and the educational goals and policies of the district's public schools. Comments and complaints regarding school personnel, apart from the superintendent, or students are generally prohibited unless those comments and complaints concern matters within the scope of school committee authority. So to limit what we're having people say, we have to limit our discussion to that specific chunk, uh, which we don't actually do yet. Um, so we will, I hope that we'll send it to policy to get updated. And again, I'd like to apologize for any harm that may have happened uh, because of my mistakes last week. And with that, I open public comment and my first speaker is Ms. Keats. Okay. Can't pick a mic. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Juliana Keys. I teach seventh grade global studies at Audison Middle School, and I am the president of the Arlington Education Association, which represents more than 800 educators in the Arlington Public Schools. Two weeks ago, two parents spoke at public participation and disparaged the work of one of my members. I want to publicly state how disappointing that is to me because it is so antithetical to everything I know about the Arlington Schools community. There's a teacher shortage in the United States and Arlington is not immune. We see the effects of that shortage in our open positions or people who leave mid-year to take jobs elsewhere. We see it in the burnout that causes mental health leaves. Filling positions is challenging filling short-term positions even more so. From my conversations with other union presidents, this is not unique to Arlington, and it is a statewide and even nationwide issue. The Arlington community has always been incredibly supportive of the schools and the school staff. Our parents are truly partners in education, which makes this town such a great place to work. That made the statements at the last meeting all the more alarming. Our system relies on people volunteering to help. It's how we staff committees, how we run extracurricular activities for students. It's how we connect with families at events beyond contract hours and how we put in the professional development that's needed to improve teaching and learning. If we create an environment that is hostile to people volunteering, why would anyone keep doing it? Dr. Homan has asked me before what it would take to create more comfort taking risks in this district. I promise you this is a prime example of why people are nervous to try. I hope that in the future we can find ways to build people up rather than tearing them down, to support those who are stepping up to help students, 
and to better embody the collaborative spirit of Arlington that I have seen over the past two decades. Thank you. And next we have uh, Ms. Sarah uh, Barton. Um, good evening, my name is Sarah Barton. I live at 57 Huntington Road, uh, and I am the CPAC chair. I came to public comment this evening to provide a couple of updates. Um, first, I want to thank the school committee for their role in um, CPAC gaining access to a fund for uh, educational speakers for our members um, through the Welcome Center, particularly the Finance Committee for raising the issue on their agenda. Okay. <laughs> Uh, we're already putting the money to use with a workshop on executive functioning, spotting it and supporting it on January 31st at 7 p.m., so everyone is welcome to come. Next, um, a reminder that CPAC's annual parent survey will be coming in January. Um, I look forward to coming back in May to discuss the results with you, and I'm in the process of finalizing the questions for this year's survey, so if the committee or any other stakeholders have suggestions for content areas or data that they believe would be useful to, to collect, uh, please do let CPAC know before winter break. And in the vein of parent feedback, um, I'm going to switch gears and also provide mine in favor of heterogeneous groupings, which I noticed were on the agenda this evening. Uh, I sometimes conduct in alumni interviews for my alma mater, Pomona College, which currently sits at number four on the list of U.S. News and World, World Reports um, liberal arts colleges. And I once asked a young man in an interview, not from Arlington, don't worry, <laughs> I was in Maryland at the time, what he hoped to learn um, from his peers when he was at Pomona. And he looked at me and he said he didn't really expect to get anything from his peers, that he was used to being among the smartest people at his high school, that he felt other students had different priorities and nothing to offer him. He just kept his head down and did his work and he planned to keep doing that at college. I hope it's not a surprise to this committee that I did not recommend this student for admission to Pomona. When we tell our kids that we're worried about rigor, this is what we're teaching them, that their peers hold them back, that their peers have nothing to offer. They can only find academic challenge and satisfaction in an environment that has been tailored just for them and excludes others. I know our students' academic opportunities feel high stakes, but inclusion and rigor are not mutually exclusive. They are mutually supportive. Let our kids realize that their academic strength lies in their ability to incorporate diverse perspectives, to find their own challenges, and to embrace their own potential. Thank you. Okay. Next, we have our AHS student representative. Since it's the week before break, we thought we'd say some like nice, hopeful, cheery comments <laughs> per usual. Um, this Friday and Saturday night is the HS Performing Arts Concert. You guys heard a sneak peek at the last meeting. I would highly recommend everyone attend. It sounds awesome from what I've heard. In the Wellness Workshop, we have a concert. Uh, this today marked the very last days of them. I personally have enjoyed them. I've heard other people have enjoyed them. Taught some 14 year old boys how to play poker today in competitive <laughs> card games. So that was always a fun time. And lastly, we like different clubs and organizations around school are hosting a variety of drives, including a clothing drive, a toy drive, a winter coat drive, and a food drive. So if any are in the main lobby, I would recommend dropping some things off for people in need. Thank you very much. So I know, yeah, I, I was about to say, I, I saw yes, these pinball machines. If any machines. of you are interested in joining a tournament where you could potentially win a $100 <laughs> prize, all you have to do is scan the QR codes all over the main lobby, <laughs> play all four pinball games, get the highest score possible, <laughs> and submit it. It's been a blast. Kids are really enjoying it. These, these are analog devices that are common to my yes. childhood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, if you have the practice, I'd recommend joining. I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So next we have a field trip approval, the HSG <coughs> conference. Yeah. So this is a um, 
longstanding conference they've attended. It's an overnight in Boston, which requires the school committee's approval. I'm sure if there are questions about it, um, Dr. Janger happens to be here. We're happy to try to answer any of them. We don't have a representative here to approve this, but it's been approved by the school committee in the past. Anyone have any questions? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Just one. Can we change the form so it says overnight and international? Because I, I don't think we're crossing any boundaries here. <laughs> that feels doable. <laughs> Does anyone have any other comments or questions? <coughs> Can I get a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cardin is joining us via Zoom, so uh, we'll need to do things roll call, but is there any further, any follow-up questions? Okay. Uh, so I'll start with Mr. Cardin. How do you vote? Okay. Ms. Fiddleson? Yes. Uh, Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exum? Yes. Mr. Schlissman? Yes. And I also vote yes. So that's approved unanimously. <coughs> Moving on, we have the EL implementation, education implementation update uh, by <coughs> Dr. Boardwalk. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to introduce uh, Shannon O'Brien and Alessandra Magalhaes, who's joining us via Zoom this evening, and they're gonna be helping me with our presentation tonight. Um, Allie and Shannon, are you there? Great, thank you. Um, I'll toss it to you to start us off. Hi, I'm Allie Magalhaes. I'm the literacy coach at the Thompson School. Uh, hold on, one Allie. second, Allie. Oh, hold on. Can we turn the volume up in here? Yeah. I can, but you have to, people with laptops have to mute it because they're going to hear, hear it echo. Mm -hmm. you know. so, but it is up. Okay. So try, then you can try again, Allie. Hi, is that better? Not much. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, I actually can't hear. Mm -hmm. Are you good? So it, it, the speakers Sorry. are over there. It is loud, as loud as it goes. Down. Okay. I can turn it up. No, it's muted there, so it doesn't bring back the air. And you have pretty good ears. Okay. Allie? Hi. Can you hear me Hi. better? No? Why don't you go ahead? I'm driving, Allie. Oh, okay. Should I continue? What do you guys think? Can anyone hear me? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes? They, cause the audience can hear her. <laughs> In the committee. <laughs> no, okay. Okay. Um, we can actually continue to the next slide too. I don't have, okay, great. Um, so Shannon and I are literacy coaches in the district and we're really excited to be here to talk to you about the EL um, implementation. There are some very exciting things happening in these classrooms um, and we're excited to share that with you tonight. Uh, before we even get into the classrooms and what's happening there, um, Dr. Ford Walker wanted us to just kind of take you back a little bit um, and review how we got here today. It's been a long journey and it's kind of surreal that EL is actually happening in the classrooms because we've gone through a long process. Um, All right, hold on. Uh, yeah. We really can't hear, yeah. Sean. It's coming out of like this speaker over there. Yeah. Back. yeah. Shannon, can you hear me at home? Yeah, we can't. Yeah, hold on a second, Allie. Sorry. Shannon, can you try talking just so we know if it's um, a problem when Allie's in? Hello. <laughs> yeah, it's very soft. Yeah, it's still okay. Oh, my goodness. We can only have one speaker going in the room. Yes. <laughs> There's no way to mesh them. <coughs> That's right, the committee consolidation went through. I don't know if it's on a minute. I didn't really want to do it. Let's try that. Let's see if you guys do a lot of that. That's the right here. Copy it. 
It's, it's going to echo. Gonna echo. Yeah, yeah, that's going to echo. That won't work. Mm -hmm. I feel like those issues are going to go away this year. So these speakers are on. These speakers are not, so that's what I just told Why? Them. A PGI that I said, can we make it so that these speakers will play the computer? Okay. These were off for these mics, so it doesn't keep that. They should be on for the computer. So he's working on that. Now. Okay. That's still going to be a problem. So could you? It's doing the microphone up and down as you're doing things. That's, yeah, that's okay. That's just picking us up. No. Test, test, one, two, one, two. We can hear you, but it's very soft, Joe. Okay. We asked them to try again with that volume up. Yeah. Yeah. Allie, say something. Hello. Hi. That's not doing anything because it's coming out of those stuff. Keep going. Say something, Allie. Hello. Nope. Um, okay. Let's move on. Are you going to talk? Okay, so I'm gonna uh, we'll we'll keep moving forward so we don't um, waste any time. Um, uh, and you want her to try again? Hello. Hi. No. Nah. Hear me? No, because it's all coming through those. So it's all. Yeah. Okay. So in the interest of time, Dr. Ford Walker will present. I can't do anything about the screen, unfortunately. <laughs> there it is. There we go. Thank you. All right. Okay. So that we can all hear. Great. Um, yeah, it's off. We're good. Yeah. So I just pro told it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, try one more time. Allie, can you try one more time? <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me? No. All right. That's okay. All right. We'll keep moving. Um, thank you so much, Allie and Shannon. Uh, please, you could stay on and maybe something magical will happen. And yeah, can we'll see. We'll questions. keep working on it. Um, okay. So um, going back a little bit to the 2022-23 school year, um, there was a consultant who worked with APS um, Hill for Literacy, and they led the district through the process of um, identifying three um, curricula um, options for our um, transition to our new literacy program. Um, there was a pretty comprehensive process that the district went through to uh, land on the final selection, which is EL education. And um, through that process, there were a number of constituents within the community, such as teachers, um, school leaders, as well as directors who um, participated in that process, in addition to, from my understanding, um, uh, different leaders as well. Uh, there was a contract that the district signed with Imagine Learning and Better Lessons, um, and the contract was a two, two different contracts. One was specifically focused on professional development, and that was through Better Lessons, and then the other contract was uh, with Imagine Learning, and they're the company that um, houses the particular online platform that uh, teachers and educators use to access curriculum. Um, in the spring of 2023, um, coaches began participating in professional development um, as well as uh, school-based um, opportunities to better understand the curriculum and just be prepared for implementation for fall uh, 2023. Uh, also, prior to the start of the school year, there were different professional learning opportunities that coaches participated in as well as teachers who would be implementing this year. So fast forward to fall of this year, and uh, we have two grades in every elementary school that are currently implementing the curriculum. 
And right now we're in a place where we are experiencing some bumps, but also a lot of areas of uh, excitement. Um, as a result of the implementation of the curriculum, our students are engaged in deeper learning um, opportunities that are really um, prioritizing the connection to science, social studies, as well as um, other literacy areas that over the past few years, our students haven't necessarily had an opportunity to deeply engage with. Um, and our teachers are currently in the process of, is that the right one? Sorry, are currently in the process of participating in professional development opportunities um, that are embedded throughout the, uh, the year. And those are opportunities that were being led by a provider that I mentioned named Better Lessons PD. Um, and also they were engaging in opportunities led specifically through the Imagine Learning platform as well. Over the past month, we've made a shift from uh, Better Lessons PD provider to the EL um, curriculum provider. And EL is the company that created the curriculum. And so um, we've experienced, I would say, better PD over the past few months, excuse me, over the past month since we've made the shift. And we've actually received, um, I would say, really great feedback for um, our implementation that we're going to apply and use as we are rolling out uh, the second um, part of the curriculum for this, the, the second half of the year. Um, so in terms of where we are now, we are currently working on planning for our cohort two teachers and our cohort two teachers are going to be specifically um, prioritizing not exactly what the curriculum is, but prioritizing how to teach uh, the different elements of the curriculum. And what I mean by that is that the curriculum is pretty intense and there are a lot of different components to it. And it's been pretty clear from the first part of our implementation this year that more support is needed with navigating through all of those different parts of the curriculum. And so for the second part of the year, our cohort two, two teachers are going to be really engaging in that work so that they're, I would say, better prepared than our cohort one teachers were um, at this time last year. Some highlights from the first part of the year have been, um, you can go to the next one, have been uh, some of our teachers have been able to participate in an EL conference that actually some of our teachers and some of our school leaders were able to participate in this conference that took place <coughs> last month and it took place in Colorado and it provided an opportunity for us to um, connect more deeply with the EL I don't want to say community, but it really is a community because our teachers and, our, and principals came back really motivated and encouraged by the professional learning experiences that they gained as a result of being there. And they were able to talk to teachers and also talk to districts that were planning on implementation in order to better support our work. And so it was very clear that there was a community there and we're super excited to be engaging with that community as a result of this shift to the EL. Um, professional development support. So in terms of next steps, um, we are continuing to prioritize visiting classrooms and visiting schools. Um, over the past two months, I've been able to visit six out of the seven schools that are currently implementing. Um, I'll be visiting my last school next week. I've had an opportunity to observe in over 25 classes and I've observed learning experiences where students have been participating in uh, the use of protocols um, that have allowed students to share their thinking that have also allowed them to connect with one another and engage more deeply with the EL content. It's been super exciting to see. I'm um, also I've been able to observe students engaging in uh, experiential learning opportunities as well, which has been super exciting. And in some of the conversations I've had with kids, they've been really excited to share their work, but also really excited to share that they enjoy um, literacy. And um, being able to hear from them has been um, empowering. These visits have also allowed me an opportunity to connect with schools to learn a little bit more about some of the challenges, some of the strengths, and also um, it's allowed for me to start to have a better sense of some of the areas that we need to plan for as we think about rolling this out at a larger scale next year. Uh, <clears throat> 
Also, um, a next step includes continuing to reflect, assess, and adjust as needed. As I mentioned before, there have been some bumps, and one of the major bumps has been really just um, orienting ourselves to the to the magnitude of materials and volume of materials, and that's been a challenge. Um, and so, again, with the shift to the EL curriculum provider, we, we, we are seeing more of a clearer path forward in terms of how to navigate that, and teachers are feeling a little bit more um, able to kind of, I would say, um, <laughs> respond to the curriculum needs that really kind of threw people for a loop at the beginning of this year. Uh, and finally, um, we are going to be um, restarting the EL implementation team. We had our first meeting last week, which is comprised of literacy coaches, school leaders, assistant principals, um, as well as our director. And the work of this team is going to be to monitor our implementation so far this year and for the remainder of the year, um, as well as to think about how we're able to um, connect with other districts that have already implemented or are either implementing um, and also tapping into our EL network now as a result of this new partnership with EL uh, education we're able to have more access to to resources that the team finds more meaningful uh, in Arlington uh, and finally I'll say that um, although we are experiencing and have experienced some bumps, these are bumps that are typical with any new curricula implementation, especially at this large scale. So um, continuing to shift as needed, as well as document our lessons so that next year uh, we can anticipate some of the challenges a little bit more smoothly and respond to them a little bit differently is something that we're prioritizing as well. Thank you. Um, Okay. Um, Allie or Shannon, say words for us again. One more time. Hello? Well, we can barely hear you. Um, she said hello. She said hello. Said hello. Okay. okay. Say and, more words. <laughs> Beside the Gettysburg address. <laughs> Sing the alphabet song. <laughs> it's a literacy uh, presentation here. I know. I was going to say um, something tremendous about EL. So could you hear me about that? <laughs> say tremendous things about EL, Shannon. Yes. Yeah. I, I just think I can hear you if you're loud into your own computer. That's better, yeah. Okay. I think one thing that is really amazing, we Allie and I are in classrooms um, four hours a day with our teams that are implementing. And we're hearing students and their level of discourse has really risen. Our first graders are saying things like, I persevered when I made this magnificent thing, or I collaborated with my group with, or I show respect when. And so our first graders are using that type of language on a daily basis. And so it's really been great to see this implementation on that way. And then in the upper grades, our fifth graders are talking about human rights and they're connecting human rights to social issues and to the books they're reading. And they're using the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they're writing about it and connecting it to their reading. So we're seeing such an advanced level of classroom discourse. It has really shifted the way that we're teaching literacy and the way that we're building their background knowledge to apply to more complex texts. And it's created an equity among students because we're all reading a shared text and all the students are interacting with the same experience. Thank you. Ali, do you have anything that you wanna add in? Hi, yes, can you all hear me now? A little bit? I'll little try bit. to yell. <laughs> um, just piggybacking off of what Shannon said, um, I think that we've been, really um, seeing how we can make the connection also to outside the classroom. Um, when kids are creating these magnificent things or creating these project-based learning, we can connect to the community as well. And that was something that we also discovered at the High Quality Work Institute that the coaches went to in Boston, is how we can really open the doors so it's not just a literacy lesson, but we're connecting it to our own selves, reflecting and then connecting it to our community as well. And just to add one more thing, I know that um, 
in the spring, I think we talked about it, like adding ELN and one thing in grades three through five that we knew that was lacking that we really needed to come in. We're um, implementing the all block, which is separate from their module lesson time. And that includes things like um, grammar, writing, mechanics, vocabulary, independent reading, working with complex texts. So those third through fifth graders get a second hour every day and they're in small group rotations where they get to be with the teacher for 20 minutes. They're in independent or pair working for 20 minutes and they rotate through. So we've really seen some success there at the grade three through five level and the grade K to two level. We're still using our Hegarty, our foundations and small group for a second hour. So our students are getting two full hours of literacy every day. Can you talk a little bit just very quickly about the trends um, at third through fifth that we're noticing in terms of some of the, the gaps that exist. Um, so for example, we, we talked a lot about how some of the lessons are requiring certain skills and we're realizing at, at third through fifth grade that our students uh, don't have those skills yet. So all block is built upon the fact that it, we've started in K and gone all the way up through fifth. So at Stratton, our fifth grade is implementing and our first grade is implementing. First graders now are being taught things like nouns, adjectives, present tense, future tense. That's not something that was previously taught in our old curriculum. And so in our fifth grade, they're expecting them to know different verb tenses and way above where they were. So we are kind of backtracking and figuring out where the gaps are for fifth graders right now that haven't been exposed to present tense verbs, to subject predicate. So we're doing that work and having to kind of do a little band-aiding. But I think as, as we know, as time goes on, the gap will close because every year it's a vertical alignment. And so teachers will see the shift happen. But this year we are trying to fill the gaps where students' knowledge hasn't been um, filled before. Um, I'll only add that I've been, um, as I've shared with the committee, doing office hours out with buildings and observing a couple ILT meetings. And some of the things that I know I've heard from teachers um, is some like real excitement about the level, as they were talking about, of rigor of the curriculum. It's a lot for teachers. They have really dug into this. They're spending endless additional hours doing their planning time um, to be prepared for these lessons. There's a lot of resources that go with it. And they're thinking very critically about what to include, what to accelerate, what to decelerate, mm -hmm. when to slow down. Um, and it's really been, and there, the excitement about protocols is such that you start seeing other teachers in classrooms that aren't implementing, starting to use some of the methods that um, are part of EL just to try something out. Um, we're trying to uh, manage excitement at the same time as we are encouraging people to try to some new things. So I've just, I've heard a lot of wonderful things from teachers who are implementing outside of um, the converse, the ob ob observations that Dr. Ford Walker is making, which I have not been a part of. Um, and it's really exciting stuff. So kudos to all the teachers who are working on this. They're working very hard on it. Okay, do people have comments, questions? Ms. Exton. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for this presentation. It's helpful to hear um, how this has started and I have a fifth grader at Stratton so I've also um, seen the the change um, uh, from the student's perspective too. Um, I just want to comment a little bit on on the plans for <clears throat> rolling this out for more <laughs> grade levels. Um, I know how much work it has been for the teachers for the coaches to learn um, and support the teachers and I um, I very I feel very strongly that we roll this out as quickly as possible and make this change but I also feel very strongly um, that the teachers feel supported um, in in the way that it's rolled out just having heard how much work it is so just with the budget season coming up too is the goal to to move this to full implementation across K to five, across all the schools for next year. Are there resources that you feel like you might need now that you might not have felt like you were needing when it, and I know you weren't here, Dr. Von Walker, when this was sort of started, um, the plans perhaps for some of this were already in place when you came in the summer, but just thinking about, are there additional resources that you feel like 
teachers and the coaches are going to need in order for this to be successful to roll this out Katie, live across seven schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I would say absolutely hands down um, the rollout. I, I credit the coaches for their immense support for being in classrooms and co-teaching along with grade level teachers and be, really being able to get a first hand glimpse but also experience around what it means to implement this curriculum because it's truly been a massive task um, and without their support and leadership um, we would not be in the position that we're in um, with that being said we have to think about how our coaches are currently providing support and we know already that they're not going to be able to provide that same level of support and that same intensity of support uh k, k to five in every single school and so we have just started our conversations around what that support needs to look like and how we can shift using the current resources that we have but there's no doubt that we are going to need additional resources to help support because um, it's just a massive undertaking uh, and so yes we will need additional resources um, but we're currently identifying how that can look also we're starting to talk about how we can reshift some of our current or restructure, excuse me, some of our current ways in which coaches support and maybe thinking a little differently around how we can partner with other people within schools to provide some level of support as well without necessarily adding on a whole bunch of new staff, if that makes sense. So we're trying to look at all of the different options. Great. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just I want to acknowledge for um, Shannon and Allie and the other coaches um, how significant of an undertaking this has been for two grade levels and how significant it will be to add what, four, four more grades at each school. So that's, that's a lot. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Um, I had two questions. Um, the first one was, I was, could we, could I get more clarity? So I have a fifth grader at Stratton and I went to back to school night and the way that it was presented to me, so I'm confused about all block because when it was presented to me, it was called win block. Um, and so then I was like, oh, well, that's what we do at Gibbs, cool. Um, and I know that it's not because what Shannon just described is definitely not wind block. But so is it all block? Is it wind block? Shannon, do you want to answer that? So there are actually at Stratton, there's two different things. They have a wind block time and they also have an all block time. So all block is based purely on literacy. And like I said, it is um, work on fluency, grammar, um, mechanics, writing, independent reading, and working with complex texts. And then the win block is like what I need. So teachers may teach, um, there's pullout services that happen during win block. They may be working on math in small groups. They may, they may do some reading skills. They may work on maybe a science concept. So win block is more geared to any content area for what I need, where all block is their second hour of literacy block that is small group focused instruction. Got it. It was the acronyms. It's the three letter acronyms that I couldn't, I wasn't tracking those. Okay, so all We're block- famous for those. All block means additional language and literacy block. Oh, that's gonna be tough for me, Shannon. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll work on that one. Okay, because we've got ELA, we have ELA, we have ALL, we have WIN. Got it. But not everybody does WIN. I guess not. I don't know. Anyway, okay. Um, thank you. That clarifies things. Um, and then, so given what you've learned looking at the fifth graders this year and that there's some confusion around, you know, present tense and adjectives, and those seem like things that are really, really important. Um, so what are we going to do? So maybe some of the kids who are doing the EL this year are getting some sort of support around that because they're they're needing to do it to put those band-aids on now. But what about the kids who are not in the pilot groups? And like, given that we've we've identified this as something and you know something that needs remediation where are we going to fix that and maybe you don't know the answer maybe we don't know the answer to that yet which is okay i i, I do want to add in it's going to definitely be a multi-year approach right like so next year we're going to have a whole new group of kids who are going to be um, missing different skills that they haven't been taught yet and it's going to be a year after year where we're going to have to make sure that we're not only teaching the curriculum that's in front of us, but also doing some backtrack, if that makes sense, with different skills that students didn't have an opportunity to, to, to learn because we didn't teach it. Um, and so, I mean, that's my quick response, right? But yeah, also yeah. there's a 
we have to think too about what does that mean for our students who were in middle school and high school. And so we, we're doing all of that thinking and all of that planning now because um, we have some work to do to catch kids up. Yeah, and it, it's, I mean, in, in my work, we sort of say to ourselves, we're like, well, we turned over that stone, okay, <laughs> right? Because once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? And so then you have to kind of, like, you have to do it. Yeah. So, thank you. Anyone else? Must have yeah, just quickly, uh, thanks very much for this. It was really helpful. Um, the the uh, partnering with other districts, can you just talk a little bit about what your sure. thoughts are on that? Sure, sure. Um, so oftentimes education can be isolating right. oftentimes we get into our room and we are in silos or we can be in our district and be in silos and um, the point of partnering with other districts is to see what's working in other places um, identify some of those lessons that were learned and see what we can apply in order to help us be more efficient save time um, and also just develop connections um, so I had mentioned that we had about seven educators who were able to attend the EL conference uh, in Colorado last month, and that was really an opportunity for folks not just to learn more about EL, um, <clears throat> but to develop partnerships, to develop an understanding of what's happening outside of Arlington so that we can uh, bring some of those lessons to Arlington um, and develop relationships so that we can better serve our students. Are there, I'm just, are there other districts in Massachusetts using EL? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, there are a lot of districts in Massachusetts. All right, great. That's what I, that's uh, surrounding see. districts. It'll be kind of a local thing where people might yeah. get together. I know the Zoom is the new thing, but yeah, you could get together in person. Yes. And then the second question, I just I did want I I was I just want some clarity on the district wide rollout. Did you say it's not going to require a lot more staff, or would it, what's you don't want to? I would right like now, us <laughs> to explore opportunities yeah. and ways of maximizing all of our staff that we have and being a little bit uh, being super thoughtful about adding on additional staff. Leveraging, good, that's a good, yes. okay, thank you. That, that helps. Can I just add, there are supports that we are not necessarily currently using that come from some of the providers for professional development for curricula like this, like EL education, that we could choose to invest in because we don't necessarily have, we can't you know, clone all of our coaches in all yeah, of the yeah. buildings. So in looking at, and I, I want to commend the team because I know that our switch from some of the providers we were working with last spring before Dr. Ford Walker was here to working directly with EL education, that came straight from our coaches who attended some professional development and they said, okay, no, we need to work with EL education. So we've switched now and I know that they as a provider have a lot of different options, some of which give us a little bit more person power in the buildings so that we're learning from the people who've developed the curriculum and deeply understand yeah. it. Yeah. So so when we talk about additional resources, we're going to try to avoid adding a bunch of people on a temporary basis, which we may or may not be able to even fill, that we don't need that beyond an implementation year, and look towards what can we do to provide as much professional development as deep as possible, as quick as possible for this implementation year. Good. Sounds like a good strategy. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Anyone else have any comments, questions? Oh. I'll just say from teachers that I hear from, time. Mm -hmm. It's just time and it's even the time that's spent doing this that they're not doing building meetings or other professional development that everyone else in the district is doing. Um, it's just, it's a big time commitment. So trying to find time for people to do this without taking them out of the classroom it has been a real challenge and people are really, they're struggling with that, but. Anything else? No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, this has been very helpful and great work. And now we can move on to the visual arts presentation. Or visual arts report. Um, thank you, Ali and Shannon. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Mr. Okay. Milner, I will be driving for you. Okay, so. Yep, so cue me. Before you get started, though, I just want to say thank you for 
making sure that our walls mm -hmm. reflect the beauty of your department <laughs> before we started our, our meeting today. Um, Leo was here decorating over the course of this week and going through some of our beautiful banners from the last banner competition, which I'm sure he'll mention. Um, so thank you and take it away when you're ready. Thank you. Um, I'll just start um, talking a little bit about um, the philosophy <laughs> of our department and what kind of undergirds the work that we do. Um, I think we'll start by saying it, and we take a really long view in the visual arts. And I think this is really summed up by the words of Gordon Brown, who was a dean of the MIT School of Engineering, who said, to be a teacher is to be a prophet. We are not preparing students for the world of today or the world that teachers have grown up in. We are preparing students for a world that we can barely imagine. Um, and in keeping with sort of the idea of taking this long view and thinking about lifelong learning, um, there's sort of two frameworks that we think about in our philosophy. So one is the studio habits of mind, which comes out of some work from Lois Hetland at <laughs> Mass Art. And so rather than focusing just on like, okay, what are the specific skills we are teaching every year or in visual arts, specific media we are teaching, which is the way um, the, the visual arts sort of standards used to be, the state and national standards and also what we're doing here are much more focused on what are the habits of mind. So we were teaching kids to observe, to develop craft, but also we're focusing on when do they have chance to stretch and explore and take risks with their artwork? When do they collaborate with other people and how do we facilitate that? When do they get to reflect and express their own ideas and envision their own, um, their own artwork and their own ideas and how to, how to show them? The uh, other thing we think about increasingly in the visual art is summed up by this sort of graphic here, which is called Crow's Theory of Everything Educational. <laughs> um, everything Pedagogical, I'm sorry. Um, Crow, John Crow is another mass art teacher who, this is, he started in the visual arts, but this really I think applies to almost every field of education. And he divided up all of education into these three different buckets. The most basic bucket is I do it, you do it. So the teacher shows someone, here's how you write a paragraph. There's a topic sentence, right? Evidence, analysis. Here's how you hold a paintbrush. Here's how you mix paint. It's very direct. The, te the students are repeating what the student, what the teacher shows them. The next, and of course, that is necessary sometimes, right? The next level is I challenge you wrestle. So you notice on this graphic that it sort of opens out. So in this example, right, we're giving students a challenge, but there's a lot of ways you could ex you could solve that challenge, right? So in in the visual arts, it might be. Everybody's we're learning how to paint, but what you paint is up to you or um, we are all working on a project where we are making art about the modern civil rights movement, but the artwork, the, you know, what you can do a sculpture, you can do a painting, you can do the media you choose is up to you. So you're setting them challenges or it could be some other sort of, you know, intellectual challenge that they are then solving and they have a variety of ways to do that. And then the final one is what we call you choose I support. And in this mode, the teacher is a coach. And it is the, we're leaving as much of the creativity up to the students. So they're choosing what they're saying and they're choosing how they're expressing it. Um, and this is often the hardest, it sounds like, you know, the easiest, but it's actually often the hardest for students to grasp. Right? But it's what we're kind of wanna push them to being able to do by the end of their career, and but not just by the end. We want them to have this experience every year. Um, and this is summed up in um, our site, another um, kind of mode of teaching, which we've begun to implement in Arlington. Um, it started a few years ago when Dave Ardito was here, and um, that's something I was working on in my last district, and we we're continuing it here, which is called teaching for artistic behaviors. And this very much connects to that previous slide. And it is a form of teaching that is very focused on scaffolding students to the point where they are able to do their own envisioning and choose <laughs> their own medium and choose their own mode of expression and the teacher is there to coach them. So if you just go to the next slide, um, I just want to give you, start with a very personal example. So one day my son, um, when I think this was second or third grade, brought home this drawing of a fox in the snow. And I was like, oh, that's really adorable. What a cute drawing. And I asked him, why did you draw this? I've never seen him draw a fox before. And he's like, ah, I don't know. Well, I pushed a little bit. And he's like, oh, the teacher asked me to draw a fox. And I was like, okay. It seemed a little strange. And then I went to the show at the school. This is not here in Arlington, by the way. Um, and this is what I saw was a wall full of foxes in the snow. Um, and then at the other, if you go to the next slide, you'll see, and you see this over and over again in traditional arts education in America, where you'll have a, an entire wall where 30 students did Mondrian, or you have a wall where 
you know, all these students made, did a self-portrait and then they cut up the self-portraits and mixed it with another student. And you created this sort of dual portrait that's somehow supposed to show the diversity of the students. Mm -hmm. But again, what we're having in all these cases is the teacher is coming up with an idea mm -hmm. of what's going to look good and what's going to be kind of easy to manage. Mm -hmm. And then all the students are making it. Mm -hmm. So there's some skills being learned, but the creativity is really mainly with the teacher and not with the child. So this is what we're trying to move away from. So what I just expressed, you see here on the left here, um, and this is a bit, a bit of a brutal summation, but I think it kind of gets to it. In, in, in the traditional visual arts teaching, the teacher is the artist. The classroom is their studio. They're in control of all the supplies. They put it out on the table for the students, and the students are making, their artist assistants making multiples of what the teacher says. What we're moving towards is this model, where the child is the artist, the classroom is the child's studio, and the teacher supports the child's creative vision. So it's again, it's not that it's freedom all the time, but that it's we want to make sure they have these experiences where they're learning how to get towards being able to use freedom and express themselves. The results have been really impressive. If you go to the next slide, um, in the first place, you'll get to see this kind of thing. So, in a tab classroom, there are some where it goes back and forth between more traditional projects, what I call, again call the I challenge you wrestle projects, and really open ended projects. But you also have some teachers who will let a child in, under the tab, they might work on one project all year. So these are a couple of examples from Thompson, where students, because of this freedom, were able to really take advantage of it. And a student spent an entire year building a model of the USS Arizona, so it's like six feet long. Another group of students spent it, um, who had been, you know, these are two girls who were really into soccer, been playing all their life and were following the Women's World Cup, and then they made this stadium to celebrate their love of the game. And, and this is how they expressed themselves. So again, they were, they got to have this freedom and do this kind of thing that they would never be able to do in a traditional curriculum. Um, this is a group of students at Pierce who had a whole business plan developed for how they would create a bakery. And they created their muffin, their, their cupcakes. And they had, if you look behind, you can't really see it, but there's a long blurb where they explain what they're gonna make and how they're gonna make it and how they're gonna sell it and where they're gonna sell it and how they're gonna advertise it. So students really start to develop their ideas. And we're noticing also with TAB that students are writing a lot more. So when you ask them to write a statement, instead of saying, well, I drew a fox because the teacher told me, it's I made cupcakes because I want to own a bakery when I grow up. Um, I made this ship because I read all these books about you know, Pearl Harbor. Um, and they, so they're writing much more when you talk to them. Um, they have a lot more to say. They're just, and they're much more engaged in general. Um, if they're still doing a lot of traditional work, if you go to the next slide, um, so you know, you'll still see students who want to draw a landscape, who want to draw a cat. You'll still see students who want to learn how to draw from observation and do the human figure. So it's not an either or, but um, it's, it's really opening up what students can do and how they can do it. And last, I just say it also, and this is, we've seen this at our schools, and in the last session we saw it a lot, behavioral issues in these classrooms went way down. A lot of the students who might be identified by some teachers, oh, that kid, you know, they have, they, they can't sit still, they don't know how to behave, they, they're quote unquote heavy hitters. In a, in a classroom where they suddenly get this freedom, are, they flourish and are deeply engaged and have to be often, you know, almost dragged away from the art room because of their, they really appreciate having this freedom. So it's been a really, a wonderful experience. And we're now at a stage where um, all of our elementary schools are implementing this in various forms. Again, there's a lot of variety in what it looks like at each school. Um, and it's influencing, you know, of course, what we also do in the middle and high schools, where we're having these conversations continually about how do we open up assignments? How do we center student growth and their own vision? Um, and I don't know if you have any questions about that, but because I'm going, going to change subjects. But. Anyone have any questions? Um, I, guess, well, yes. I just wonder if you could talk to how you do skill development, because it seems like there's certain things I need. I mean, certain technique stuff that it'll mm -hmm. help them to learn. Yeah. So we kind of divide up the curriculum. We have a few different teaching modes. So we do absolutely do skill builders where we say, you know what, everyone is going to do this. And not everything is always up to choice. Um, so this could be something where we think we know everyone loves it and we're going to do it anyway. So we're going to teach it all together. So for ceramics, if you teach ceramics, everybody wants to do it. We don't need to, um, 
it, that's something we make sure everyone does. There are also some things which you realize if they don't try it out, they're never going to get it. So for instance, you know, a lot of our teachers will make sure everyone tries printmaking and block printing because if they don't try it, they won't understand it. But we, what we've discovered is you can make a lot of things optional and then kids will opt in. And at first you might start with one small group of kids opting in, but then the kids next to them will say, oh, that looks really cool. And then the kids start teaching each other and it starts to spread organically. And it makes a big difference, of course, for our students when they <clears throat> choose something versus being forced to do something. We've also found in the past, you know, we have had all this required curriculum and, you know, you teach it year after year and then they get to high school and they don't know it, they don't remember it. And it's often because they really weren't engaged. Um, so we're, some, we're, you know, experimenting and we have different requirements at different schools and, and teachers are experimenting which are the required assignments, which are more open, which are optional and kids get a choice. Um, and we're kind of tinkering with that and we're going to sort of come over, I think, after a few years, kind of decide, are there certain things we really want to make sure everyone tries and are there certain things we just leave open? Thank you. I just want to say I have a third grader and a first grader at the Pierce School and those cupcakes when I looked at the slide deck earlier today I immediately remembered seeing them in the spring when we had um, the first time since I've been at Pierce I don't know if this happened pre pandemic an evening of the arts where Molly Atrezik and Ivan Shu sort of created this great I mean it was really wonderful. And I just rem I remember walking around in those little statements, the artist statements, and I had heard about it. I was like, how are these kids all? I mean, like that that seemed like a real stretch for my kindergartner. It was, <laughs> but they were so proud. They were all, I mean, it was a really, it was really great evidence of everything you're talking about here. So yeah, that was really wonderful to see. And yeah, she's that's still uh, a work in progress, but it's yeah, making great progress there at that school as well. Thank you. Um, so um, we are, we just want to talk to you through some of the other changes going on in the visual arts um, in the district. So, um, oh, sorry, if you should go back a slide. So we do have, uh, at the elementary level, we are piloting a couple of different programs. Um, so at um, three schools right now, actually, sorry, two schools, at uh, Dallin and at uh, Bishop, we are piloting an intensive um, schedule. So as you probably know, art is traditionally taught students get it once a week for the entire year. Mm. Um, if they have it on a Monday, they miss, you know, <clears throat> like 10 classes a year, you know, so it's, it's not much art and it's, it's kind of sporadic. What we're experimenting with at these schools is a, an intensive schedule where instead of having it once a week for the whole year, they'll have it two quarters of the year, um, for, but twice a week. So this, we're doing this with art and visual art and music. So They'll have first and third quarter, they'll have visual art twice a week, and second and fourth quarter, they'll have music twice a week and no art. Obviously, we'd rather have twice a week all year, but that's not a possibility in our current schedule. But what we're, the reason we're trying this out, and again, this thing we tried um, in the, my last district, um, is we've noticed that when you do this, when you have twice a week, you, you get, firstly, um, a lot more relationship building. So students and teachers are able to build relationships much more quickly you get can get into a lot more depth kids remember what they're doing from class to class um, you don't have to remind them or like remember what they're doing and um and again therefore more continuity in what they're working on so it's the teachers have certainly noticed the kids have noticed it's much more intense it's much more in depth um and we're, we're going to kind of experiment with it and see how it goes because of course the trade-off is then you have half the year with no art so it is a trade-off but we're hoping that it leads to again greater depth more finished products more uh, buy-in from the students um, and we'll, we'll see how it goes another pilot we're trying is the interdisciplinary collaboration so we do have an imbalance in our schedule as you may know you know we have some of our schools have a much larger population than others um, so in the schools where there's a slightly less popular lower population so pierce and bishop and dallin um, our art teachers there and our music teachers are making a real push to do more interdisciplinary collaboration. And this is something which, you know, something we've always, you know, known is, is really powerful. There's a lot of research about, you know, when kids get a chance to write and think about something, read about something, but also make art in response to what they're studying. Um, there's much greater depth of learning and something they hold on to for often much more of their lives. Um, and, but, 
you know, it's hard to, it needs, it needs work. It needs common planning time. It needs actually teachers need to push in and work, work with the general education teachers or, uh, and find time to meet with them outside of the class. Um, so we're trying it at these schools and planning collaborations right now that will take place in the spring. Um, and one thing of ads is, you know, since we just saw the presentation about um, e the EL curriculum is this also jibes really well with ex expeditionary learning as it was originally called. And this is something that in its early stages was a big part of EL was that there's arts as well integrated into so students will learn during doing these intensive units and then having sort of a capstone project integrating the arts. So this is something we're not doing that part this year because again, we're, as, as Julie mentioned, teachers need time to plan and they don't even have time to collaborate and plan on the EL curriculum, let alone now can you go meet with your art teacher. So it's something we'd love to do more of um, and we just you know, need the planning time. Um, and of course, the other sort of thing that's holding us back is, you know, a school like Thompson, where there's the art teacher there teaches 28 sections, um, <laughs> simply has no time to also do this on the side. So would love to something we'd love to do and hope at some point we can think about how do we get the staffing at some of these other schools to be able to support these other uh, collaborations. Um, another, this is an initiative, academic conversation. Um, is an initiative we are piloting. Um, well, it's something that is part of the professional development work going on um, at the high school um, across disciplines, but it's also something we are focusing on um, in the visual art and at the secondary, sort of six through 12 level, but especially at the high school. So again, what we're working on is developing um, much more discussion models where the kids are doing the talking to each other. As you probably remember from your own, your own educational experience, right? So much of discourse in classrooms is sort of ping pong with the teacher on one side of the table and all the kids on the other side of the table. And it's teacher, student, teacher, student, teacher, student. What we're trying to get away from in the visual arts is we're trying to break down that paradigm and give much more time where the kids are talking to each other and having engaging in conversation where they push each other's learning and engaging in analysis and th synthesis and exploring each other's ideas, giving each other feedback and building on it. So we are trying out different models. We are conducting peer um, observations, um, which is again, uh, something going out of high school that we are also um, enthusiastically adopting and trying out. And we're hoping to bring this, start this there and kind of bring it down gradually into the middle and then elementary schools as well. Slide. Um, I want to update, I mentioned this when I saw you all uh, last year, but um, we had a big program of study revision at the high school and um, it's going really well. So I just wanted to share some of you know, what's happening there. Um, you know, as, as mentioned, we, um, we took, got rid of um, the Foundations of Art class, which was sort of a, a bottleneck that prevented students from focusing on their, you know, next slide, um, on their uh, particular subject area or media that they're interested in. Um, and this has enabled us to then open up a lot of new programming. So we have um, four new programs. Um, we have metal smithing and jewelry making, filmmaking, um, animation. Um, we added a mural painting and set design. So our students are now building the sets for the shows that are coming up and planning murals um, to fill this uh, beautiful but empty school. Um, and we're also expanded our digital, photo digital photography program so that you know, all students can have access to SLR digital cameras um, to do higher quality and professional standard work. Um, all in told, there's you know, um, 12 new, new courses where it have been added and then several other courses, almost all of our existing courses were changed from year long to semesterized courses so that students could experiment more, try out more different things. And this has also allowed us to offer more higher level courses. So um, our, all of our lower level courses are, are mixed, they're heterogeneous, but um, we now have also um, a lot more uh, level two, level three, four, and even level five classes. So students can really specialize as they get into the upper grades. Um, and it's been very popular. All of our classes are full and you know, the course requests um, more than doubled um, as, as a first choice for the uh, visual arts elective. Um, and then there are a lot of courses where we have long waiting lists right now. So we're very excited about the work we've done and um, it's, been, it's been really good to see in action. Um, uh, we've also 
as you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Peer Show. Um, that has been a big thing we're very excited about getting back to. Uh, last year was the first year where we had visual arts in person shows at every school. Um, this is something we will do again this year and expand. Um, we're also working with uh, the performing arts department to uh, at every school try to align it so you have an art, visual arts and music performing together um, just to bring in more people um, and that will be happening here at the high school as well. Finally, um, if you go to the next slide, we are um, initiating um, a lot more public art programs. So as you see in this room and on that slide, there's uh, we've had for a number of years youth banner project. Um, the family of Gracie James has been generously funding the printing of these banners every year. We're doing that also this year, um, and they will be up in um, Mass Ave in the spring. Um, so that will continue, but we are also starting public art projects at the middle school and at the high school. So at the middle school this year, we're gonna be starting um, mural making clubs where they, our teachers will work with students interested in painting murals in, the, in Audison. Um, at the high school, we are starting, in addition to the mural and the set design class, um, we are starting a whole process to gather um, places around the school. Teachers and administrators can submit ideas and uh, students can submit locations. We'll then sort of have an inventory of locations that can be decorated and we will then have students um, submitting proposals for designs. Some of them will just be things that we print on vinyl. Some will be painted on panels and put up. Some will be um, printed on large vinyl sheets and, and stuck adhered to the wall. Um, and some of this is even including some of our really large public spaces. We have, you know, the architects uh, have a plan for a mural uh, of a printed mural in the cafeteria, but we are, they are now competing with our students who will be submitting their own designs for a 12 foot by 72 foot mural. So I'm really excited to see how those come out. Um, and you know, also hoping to eventually get these out or have our students out working in the community. So I know I'm meeting later in the week with um, uh, the Arts Council. Um, the Arlington Arts Council, we're starting to build those partnerships so we can identify places in this community where they can start to work on murals, either with professional artists or having their own sites that they can produce work in. Um, I think that's about all I got for you, except actually one more thing. Last thing I want to mention, thank you for your patience, is we are also really working on modernizing the visual arts department. Um, until this year, everything we teach at, in, in Arlington would have been recognizable to, let's say, a high school teacher in 1920. Um, you know, we had photography, printmaking, film, oh, not film, sorry, um, ceramics, drawing, painting, sculpture, etc. cetera. Um, this is the first year that we are moving into late 20th century media, like animation and uh, filmmaking. And also now moving into 21st century media, like um, digital art making. Um, and these are extremely popular. They're obviously a huge part of the creative economy when that's do people work on in the arts and as careers. Um, and we are now just now bringing them into Arlington High School. And it's been, Kids are really excited about it. A digital art is something that you know we've seen kids of all ages really get into, um, and it's not something that competes with. It really supports the work they're doing, you know, analog work uh, by hand. But of course, it's very expensive. We, you know, we need to, for instance, if we're going to have digital art as a um, accessible in all our elementary, middle, and high schools, we need to go from our current inventory of 90 iPads to about 165 iPads, um, 168. So. Um, that's you know a big expense that is we'd like to invest in um, because we've seen I've certainly seen the results of how this works in, in other districts um, and some of our other programs we've just started like animation and filmmaking they're very expensive to get off the ground once you get them going they're actually cheaper to run than your average um, your studio art course but they do take a significant investment to get going and I just hope we have the support of the school committee to do that so, thank you thank you Mr. Thurman. This is a great presentation. I learned a lot. Um, I have a question. Since we've eliminated the foundations of our bottleneck at the high school, do you have like any sense of the numbers of kids participating in all the electives you mentioned? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, I do. I mean, I, the, well, this is, I don't have the, actually, I think we, do, I can certainly get this okay, number. Okay, it doesn't have to be precise, but, but is it, it feels. It's a lot more. It's and, right. So that's yeah. what I was kind of hoping. Yeah that I would hear. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, they're all full. You got to beat the mic. And oh, yeah. Sorry. Math. <laughs> yeah. Is they're all full, there are five teachers. 
Um, okay. So you're talking about 600 yeah. kids at any given time. So the outcome is more kids are participating because we eliminated this. Problem. Yes. Yeah, um, also, there, I mean, there's a lot of kids who have been able to get into class. And you know, we have, for instance, like woodworking or, or um, ceramics. You have, you know, the waiting list. Big waiting list. Yeah. yeah. So, but that was always the case, I think. Yeah, those are always the case. But there's more courses like metalsmithing and film, which are the starting to grow in popularity as well, and that's that's expanding. So, yeah, all the classes are full. Yeah, and we it's it's it's, it's been good. Quite okay, popular. I just yeah. that's that's what I kind of. And in terms of the um the the pilots you talked about, that's ideas you have for a pilot that you want to see in just in school year twenty five next year. No, they're both things that we are the schedule pilot at the elementary school, the intensive schedule that has started now. Oh, that has okay. that has started. Um, we're we're going to see how it goes. Yeah, the interdisciplinary collaboration pilot yeah. is right now in a planning phase, <coughs> but we're hoping to have some of those units be taught in the spring. Oh. So it's right now it's at a level of like individual teachers meeting together, who oh. you know volunteer voluntarily, um, and we're hoping to you know produce some really good units and learn from it that we can you know then have some some exemplars that we can share. So thank you. Yeah, Great. small steps, though. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so I want to go back to the bottleneck for just a second yeah. <laughs> to the foundations of art. So I think what is fabulous is that like we've we've eliminated that. Right. And I guess what I would just say as somebody who talks to a lot of families and a lot of like like middle school families is that what we haven't eliminated is that people still think it exists <laughs> right so like those who have older kids or no older they're like oh no no you have to take that foundations of art class no you can't take those things freshman year oh no your your art teacher in eighth grade is going to give you a recommendation to skip that right and that like narrative is still very pervasive out there like hopefully by the time like laura's kids get there they'll be like what are you talking about like foundations of art but we do have i think a few more years ahead of us of people who were their parents either they have older kids or they've talked to other people and they very are committed to this idea that like you cannot take upper level art unless you like go through this like mm -hmm. you know this gate right so yeah. i think as you um talk to families and as you work on thinking about how you introduce this um at you know for eighth graders at the audison or even talking to current freshmen who maybe haven't met their fine arts requirement just remembering that like removing the barrier is like is fabulous and it and it still like very much exists in the minds of many many people mm -hmm. in our community because it was there for such a long time so um as we keep talking about it i think it's great it was part of this conversation I talk about it with people all the time. I'm like, hey, no, you can, you just go right in now. Um, but I do think it's important to remember that the sense of its existence is still pretty pervasive, at least has been my experience. Yeah. Thank you for the reminder. It's like, like, oh yeah, we gotta, you know, get to all the eighth graders is, is the main thing. It's really important. Yeah, right probably three more years of like messaging and then people will have forgotten that it exists. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, Mr. Shulton? Um, so we've got a new high school facility. Uh, can you just very briefly talk about how the uh, the new high school is helping you uh, move forward with the art program? Because I've heard a lot of really positives from the teachers who work here uh, about the, the the new facility allowing them to do great things with kids. Yeah, no, it's been <laughs> wonderful. I mean, I think our teachers really appreciate what we have. Um, the facilities are are fantastic. Um, so, you know, we have obviously a great woodworking shop. Um, we have our CAD sort of computer. We have a computer room where people are able to do design work and SolidWorks and, and AutoCAD to design things that they could then, you know, build in our wood shop or with our um, 3D printers and laser cutters and, and things of that nature. Um, we now have, you know, again, converted a classroom into a metal smithing and jewelry making. So the kids are, are soldering. They, were, they mm -hmm. will soon be welding. Mm -hmm. um, there's the um you know again the ceramics you know we have two kilns again we probably could use a third but you know we don't we're, we're fine right now um and um you know we've added screen printing so we've added you know have there's a lot of sort of space still to sort of add these components um you know we have one classroom that's all the animation filmmaking photography mm -hmm. and able to um really work that out and, and make sure all of those are supported so i think it's it's really we haven't yet, you know, found something Oh, this, this medium we can't do because, you know, of our you know, lack of facilities, it really does feel like we're still, we have what we need and we have potential to grow 
in terms of what we can offer technically. And the rest of the district, I remember the, when we reopened Stratton with a kiln in that building, we went from one kiln to two on the elementary level, I think that was? Uh, the kilns of the elementary schools? Yeah. I think there are right now there are three schools mm -hmm. that have, I mean, that's, you know, would be nice, of course, that we have, uh, yeah, th three of our elementary schools have kilns at this present time. But yes, that certainly would be nice to have them. Yeah, I'm just so, sort of thinking that now that we've got this uh, facility here, how do we, uh, do we have the facilities and the uh, uh, programming that would support kids as they're moving up so they can take full advantage of this? Um, that's a very good question. I mean, I think that's part of why, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can move. I mean, for one thing, as you mentioned, like having a kiln in every school would certainly help. Mm -hmm. um, that's something kids love and would support that growth towards the ceramics program in the high school. I think adding um, the iPads, being able to have those, and it's not like everyone needs one, but you know, if you have, for instance, 12 at each elementary school, mm -hmm. it could be something where you could rotate through all the upper level students. Um, and then if you had, you know, more at the middle schools, that would then really facilitate kids moving into that in with a ton of skills that they can apply at the high school level. What software are you putting on the iPad? What software? Yeah. Um, so the apps we use, the main one we use is Procreate. It's mm -hmm. a digital art app. There's also some um, <clears throat> animation apps. Mm -hmm. um, one's called Rough Animator. We're, we, that one we're hoping to use. We haven't got one, that one set up yet. Um, the, you know, the people use stop motion mm -hmm. app, um, but mainly it's Procreate. Is the And we have enough money for licenses. For the what, sorry? Licenses for the software. Yeah, those are those are those are app based, so they're like five bucks yeah. a pop. Those are not those are not much. It's more it's more the hardware itself that's um, been a been a, a hurdle. Okay. I love the presentation. It's full of visual joy and, and beautiful things and uh, you, you best PowerPoint of the year so far. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I completely agree. I just emailed my guidance counselor to switch out of econ and into the <laughs> Thank you very much. That might be a conversation. A different opinion on the other side. Okay. I love it. Next, we have Dr. Dinger. What is next? All right. Well, thank you. I'll be driving. You're so, driving. following the best PowerPoint presentation of the year. I know. I was just like, Dr. 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 Was honestly, was, uh, while he was presenting, I was just going, this is really visually, really interesting. I'm going to send him my slides to clean it up. Um, so, the f I have two presentations, I think, in a row. Yep. The, the first is, once again, a brief, hopefully, return to talking about heterogeneous grade nine English. Oh, that's the first one? That is the first one. That's at least that's what I thought. First. Is that the first one? Which one do we you want the, first? We have the we'll sip first. Sip first. Yes. Oh, all right. First. The sip is on the screen. That is what I'm doing. Yeah. And you'll notice that it looks very similar to the other one. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, hi, I'm here to talk to you about my school <laughs> plan. Um, one of uh, a number of the initiatives that are um, going to be followed have been mentioned already this evening, which is nice. It means that there's some connection. People are actually embedding these things in the things that they're doing. Um, so my understanding was I was only supposed to have 10 slides. I have 14. I will go as quickly as possible. Um, so next slide. <clears throat> So this is our academic mission, um, which I think is worth reviewing. I always underline those three sections, right? That our goal at Arlington High School is learning, connecting, and caring in a safe, supporting, and nurturing environment, which is the social emotional piece, um, in order to create knowledge, values, and intellectual curiosity. And that ties obviously into the school mission. Next slide. Um, into the mission of the district as a whole. Um, some of the big things that are driving sort of life in Arlington High School right now are enrollment growth and the new building. This slide that talks about enrollment growth. As you can see, we've been creeping up pretty steadily. We went up this year by about 30 more students than we had expected in most of our best estimates. We were thinking we were going to hit about 1580 last year. We've hit 1613. It um, really depends on what kind of enrollment um, expectations you have. Um, 
in terms of estimating how many kids you think we're going to have next year. If you do long-term trends, we have about 20 students. If you do last year's trends, we have about 100 students. I'm going to guesstimate that we're going to get something comparable last to last year's attrition from eighth to ninth grade um, and something comparable to previous trends in the other grades, because I think we got a bunch of kids back at the upper levels because of the new building and because people were recovering from COVID and that that won't sustain. That puts us around 50 to 60 new students next year. So when I come to you and ask for money later, those are the numbers that I'm working from. Next slide. <clears throat> So this year, there's been a lot going on, um, which is hard to tell given how sort of lovely and pleasant the environment of the school is in a lot of ways. We've moved over the course of basically a weekend from the um, half of the old building into the new building. So we now have, and this is new terminology for everyone, I, I do not like that the architects call the middle of the building the spine. It makes sense from a structural point of view, but it is not what it is in the school. So I will be talking from now on about the STEAM wing, the humanities wing, the central building and the performing arts wing, and next year, the athletics wing. Um, so we moved into the new central building and humanities wing, which meant that our world language department, our facts department, our English department, our history department, our school counseling department, our nursing clinic, our library, and our cafeteria all moved over the course of a week. And although people hit the ground running, people are still recovering. That was a lot for people who are definitely ready for vacation. Um, if you look at our MCAS scores, the quick eyeball version of this is we saw some widening gaps um, post-COVID. Those widening gaps have tipped up slightly in most of the areas, which is a nice hopeful trend. And in general, our MCAS scores remain relatively high and relatively consistent. We were really excited this year to see that we ticked up in the um, school climate and culture measures in Panorama. There were some really big gains in teacher-student relationships and rigorous expectations. And that's nice because those were things that we were really working on. Um, and so it's nice to see that when you focus energy on that and the teachers are really working hard at that, that that's something you see in the class. Um, we'll talk about some of the other trends when we get to the next slide. Inclusive, oh, not there yet though. So obviously one of our big initiatives over the last year and over this year are the piloting of the heterogeneous grouping in English 9. And we've continued to see some significant increases in curriculum age participation with relatively stable results on almost everything else. And we were um, really interested to see pretty substantial increased participation in AP exams with maintained score levels. Um, next slide. <clears throat> so what are the challenges? Well, we can, in the fall, we had to build a schedule based on the old building, and that's still affecting the schedule this year. Hopefully some of that will smooth out next year when we have space. The mid-year move, what the um, construction company refers to as day two adjustments. The way they talked about it is the building is ready for you to move in. And then we'd say, but that's not finished. And they'd say, that's a day two adjustment. Mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that are still being sort of fixed and worked through in the building are still taking a lot of attention, although the building is running really smoothly and very effective as a space. Um, and then phase three construction is still affecting us. We still have the construction all through the back. We have a limited parking. Um, we actually went through a brief period of really not having enough parking for staff, which is something we've been working pretty hard to try to adjust and we'll get better after the preschool opens. Um, and in this new building and even before the new building, maintenance facilities, I was looking back in every um, budget request I've ever made. The last blurb about it was always that we really need to work on custodial and maintenance support. But we're in a brand new building ran a study that said how many facilities and custodial support we would need to maintain that and we're not there mm -hmm. um, and our custodial staff are working i mean you walk through the building and it is really clean mm -hmm. which is really pretty remarkable because there's a small number of people who are working very hard to do mm -hmm. that we want to make sure the building doesn't fall apart and our custodians don't get injured um, trying to keep the place safe mm -hmm. um, and then we obviously have these ongoing challenges we continue to see disproportionality for traditionally underserved district groups, right, based on race, special education status, ELL status. We continue to work on those. We see some positive trends, but it's, a, it's an ongoing issue. And um, we have a real desire to increase equity of access to higher level curriculum because we see disproportionality in how students are served in those areas. It's one of the areas that we looked at in terms of heterogeneous grouping. 
And then um, we really want to move beyond just MCAS scores. We're really interested in students learning deeply and being deeply engaged in the work. And when we look at the panorama scores, those remain the areas that are the lowest. Um, and that is, you know, where students are not just learning effectively and saying that they learned a lot and that they like their teachers, but they're really excited about what they're learning. It's something we're really working on. And as I said there, belonging continues to receive the lowest levels of favorable responses. I will say that when you compare it to what we can see for comparison data, we do pretty well for high schools in America. But when you have less, you know, roughly 50% of your students really positively feeling that they belong, that's not where we want to be. Mm -hmm. um, we would really like people to feel more a stronger sense of connection. Next slide. So we've, got, we've developed four strategic goal priorities, which each gets a couple slides. So the first I've talked about a lot. I'm going to have another presentation about, so I won't speak very much about it now. But that's the heterogeneous English 9 pilot, which we're now in year two of. We've seen really positive outcomes. And we're looking now to think about what we want to do to secure those outcomes and move them forward. And so obviously the things under consideration are now what I refer to as inclusive grouping, which is <coughs> having everybody together in the same mm -hmm. class. Um, and then how we look at the grading practices, heterogeneous grouping is the current practice, but there's been discussion about honors for all, as well as whether there are other areas in which we want to, where it would be appropriate to use those strategies and to expand access. Um, so, the purpose of that is, right, to increase equity of access to higher level curriculum um, and to consider those other things. Next slide. And so again, you'll see this slide. You've seen these slides before. You can see there's a really substantial increase in participation. We see that across all demographic groups and then grades. Grades have maintained, again, relatively steady. Next slide. So the next initiative, which um, thank you, Leo, for giving us a shout out to. Um, this is something that's coming from the work of our ILT over the last year, which is particularly exciting because it's a real staff driven conversation. Um, and so there's sort of three pieces to understand about what it is we're trying to do. So first we're focusing on academic conversations in all classrooms. So what is an academic conversation? That's back and forth dialogues in which students talk to each other about a topic and explore it by building and challenging and negotiating their ideas. Most interestingly, academic conversations done effectively really focus on a lot of the things, again, Leah was talking about, which is not, I teach you learn, but I'm interested in what I think, and I'm interested in learning what you think. In academic conversations, you can jump to the next slide for one second, or no, actually two slides down, are really interesting because they combine the sort of two big focus points of our school improvement plan and a lot of our district efforts. They are rigorous, using rigorous skills that are taught directly to students, and they focus on engaging students in understanding themselves and each other, which builds belonging and engagement. And as you can see, the overlap of those two things is really what we're talking about when we talk about deeper learning, right? It's learning that's rigorous and engages with my own identity and in changes in my own thought. So you can slide back up two more slides. Make sure I didn't forget anything. And so then the second piece of this is that the way we're doing this is through two cycles of learning walks. And learning walks are opportunities for teachers to visit another teacher's classroom and to talk about, in this case, what they're seeing in terms of academic conversations as an anchor to that conversation. And that's driven in part by our teachers' reports. 60% of teachers report that the most effective professional development is talking to their peers and working with their peers. They also reported that they were not feeling connected to their peers. And so this builds that connection amongst our staff. Um, and then in many ways, Learning Walks model for the teachers the same kind of academic conversations we're hoping to see for the students. On to number three. So number three was a little bit hard for me to describe sort of as an initiative, but we talked again about how we've had these improvements in our results on culture and climate. That's the result of a whole host of connected activities that we've been doing around school culture and around equity. Um, and we are, you know, a lot of those programs, a lot of those efforts were sort of broken or discontinued over COVID. So last year, a lot of them were relaunched. And this year, again, we're recommitting to those and doing those in a more rigorous way. The students talked about the wellness workshops. We'll be doing the inclusion workshops. Um, in the spring, we are continuing to work on the Voices United workshops that we did this fall. 
the affinity and anti-bias groups are something that we're supporting through clubs. Um, an advisory program has some more structured work around this. There's other things related to these initiatives, but that collection of initiatives are part of a general team of folks who are working together in order to work on our culture, climate, and goals. And you can see, next slide. These are sorted in order of which one's got the most increase. Um, and so you can see we've seen a higher level increase for teacher and student relationships and rigorous expectations. But overall, school climate and belonging are also close behind in terms of things that we've seen improvement in. Next slide. And then our strategic family engagement goal. So one of the things that we found last year and was, and actually during COVID, was that when we really were systematic about focusing communications around a particular area during COVID, it was around attendance. Last year, it was around attendance. We saw really significant improvements. So our attendance last year was one and a half percent higher, given that it's around 94%, going to 95.7% is actually a pretty good thing to do. And that's during a time when actually chronic, um, um, chronic attendance remains a significant issue. That's something that continues to be up. And attendance overall continues to be an issue. And so it's a real testament to the systematic work on the deans and the teachers part to keep up on top of that. So this year, what we've been doing in sort of following up on that is to be a little bit more systematic about our communications about students who are struggling in terms of grades. And so we formalize the midterm check-in. Teachers are expected to be up to date with their grades at that midterm check-in. And then a whole series of communications go out generally to teachers, to parents and students, encouraging them how to check their grades, but also then how to follow up, as well as targeted communications. Um, so teachers, you know, so if you have a student who's getting a D or an F, you would receive communication from the deans, you'd receive communications from teachers. Um, and follow up on the counterpart of the counselors to see whether or not that's going. That's seeming pretty positive. It's helping us tighten up in a lot of ways. It leads to really good conversations with kids about communication, with staff about grading. Um, so our hope is that that's going to lead to an improvement in grade outcomes overall. So what do we need? Um, depending on our enrollment, <laughs> um, we need a few more teachers. Um, you know, and I think for, to be on the safe side, you know, I think having two or three more teachers to cover additional growth, especially because we have an enrollment bubble coming up behind us. Mm -hmm. And so really being prepared to, have, you know, built out in the spaces where we anticipate the largest growth so that that's not all hitting us at once is going to be important. Um, the also the new building was designed to be built with four deans. Um, dean, our sort of general target would be the deans wouldn't have over about 500 students and the counselors wouldn't have over about 250 students. Right now our deans are at about 550 students apiece and they'll be going up. Um, so we could wait until they're sort of bursting at the seams, but we're really looking right now to add a dean. The idea would be that then the year after we would be adding an additional counselor so that we were able to keep on having those consistent levels of support. I talked a little bit before about custodial needs. Um, we would really love to be able to get closer to 20 custodians. Um, and um, the new facility is really complicated. Um, we've got automated systems. We have lots of systems that need to be integrated. You've been seeing what goes on in this facility. Mm -hmm. We, unlike most of the other schools, have multiple users, right? So we are not one school. We are three schools and the district offices and community education. Um, we are in use 24 seven, people are in and out all the time. And so given all of the challenges of repairs and integration of systems and all of that, we would love to have what we call an operations specialist. So somebody who supervises the entire site so that it's one phone call. Right now the educators do an awful lot of that integration and making sure mm -hmm. that just things aren't broken. Um, and that takes away a lot of attention from educators towards um, the facility. And there are people who are better equipped to do this and we would make better use of our training. Every day there's a point at which I walk down the hall and say, for this I went to education school. Um, and it's often something that has very little to do with education. I think that's it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions?
Mr. Thelman. Thank you. I'm in first minute. Oh. Go ahead, Mr. Oh, Thelman. Okay, thank you. So thanks very much. Helpful thank presentation you. as always. Um, I do want to talk, talk a little bit about the last slide. Uh, you know, I, I do think, I think it's important. We've invested, you know, $291 million in this facility, uh, taxpayer money, state money. So I do think uh, it's important that we have a conversation here at this table about the exact number of custodians we should have in the building. I don't think we should, I'm like, no one can commit to a number right now. And can, so I just want to say that, thank you for bringing that to everyone's attention. It should be a high priority because of the investment that the taxpayers have made. My question about the operations specialist, so that's not, that's not a position in this year's budget, something you want in next year's budget, and that would be- a position that I sent to, to Michael, but I didn't fill out my form, so I think you haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so that's what you sent to Michael, okay. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and so right now, did you just, so when right now, when, 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 a, when an issue is raised, they just, some people go to their department head, their department head goes to you. How does it, what happens? Like if you can't make something work in your class? I mean, for the most part, yeah. if you can't make something worse, you're supposed to go into asset solutions. I think that's what it's called, yeah. right? Yeah. I call it the dude, but mm -hmm. right. it's school, school, dude. school yeah. dude. So student people, teachers should be entering things into school dude. <clears throat> most of the time, if it's time dependent, they also shoot an email to me and Mr. McCarthy. Yeah. Um, and you know, then we will often, I mean, if it's a custodial issue, we'll get on the radio of the custodians. Yeah. Um, but we have a limited number of custodians <laughs> in an enormous building during the day. So this person would get those emails before went to This person would get those emails. Before. Yeah, okay, that's what I understand. And that person would try to troubleshoot mm -hmm. and figure out the problem and solve it. Okay. I like that. Mm -hmm. Of course you do. <laughs> okay, thank you. That, that was the extent of my questions. Yes, Mr. Schlick? Sort of interested in the enrollment issues um, because I, I've had the task of trying to project enrollments and it's difficult. And I think the fact that we have a new building that is going to be attracting people who might have avoided the construction zone uh, changes the dynamics. Um, I noticed that we've had an uptick in Minuteman enrollment coming out of the district. Then again, they've got a new school. Uh, so when we're looking at changes in enrollment as a function of the ninth or the eighth grade numbers uh, I, i'm sort of curious how many kids are coming in who were not in our district eighth grade and such as at a private school or moving into town and how many kids within that group in the eighth grade are going off to private schools minute man are, are those numbers you're changing? talking about the going into right your... yeah you know so obviously we've got say 500 kids in eighth grade, we're not going to have 500 kids in ninth grade. We're going to have some other number. Right. And I'm just wondering what the deltas are on the in and out. So I have never been able to track that. I don't know if you can. Um, what we have tracked instead is the net, mm -hmm. right? So that you know that, <coughs> you know, 95, we, you know, if there's 400 kids, we get 95% of those kids. Mm -hmm. They're not the same 95%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, we get about 92% of those and three or 4% more. Mm -hmm. I think we have had last year and this year mm -hmm. um, a substantially higher number of students transferring back in and a substantially higher number of students transferring back in after the year started. Mm -hmm. um, we got more students back from Minuteman than we have in the past. Hmm. Um, and, you know, I think we had something like 10 students re register just in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's different, right, because it's a higher mobility rate, which also affects students' ability to, you know, to be supported. Because as you've commented in the past, sometimes some of our data, if you break it out by how long the students have been here, mm -hmm. you have very different outcomes for students yeah. who've been here for a while. Uh, that, that's really a critical number on me, for me because I, the way I'm looking at the, the publicly facing data, yeah. uh, a child who's starting off with this in ninth grade is really on track to to graduate in four years. Uh, it's the students who are coming in f during those four years that, that tend to need extra time, particularly the EL students, which is very understandable. It's a good thing to stay for a little while longer and get a better command of English language. Um, the central spine. Uh, I'm sure the biology teachers love central the name. Central building. 
I, I'm thinking, no, look, I showed pictures of the school to people I went to high school with. We went to a high school that was very similar in, in feel of this, of having the four wings and a central area, which we called the commons. I like that term. Yeah, I mean, let, let's get out of biology, and I think commons is kind of a New Englandish name, or students have to live with it and love it. So if they come up with a better lane, name, I'd much rather have them name it. But uh, uh, it, it seems like a destination, and the and the pinball machines over there sort of add to that common area feel to it. The, the, I came through here the other day, and after school, and kids were hanging out those machines. It was just such a positive environment that you know and you see kids in here in the in the music area rehearsing and and just being involved in the building after dismissal and they're loving this place no it's it's yeah. it's it's working the way it should which is what's really exciting i mean again leo's still here leo leave i keep waving to him i mean one of the things it's not just the individual arts um facilities that's really exciting it's the way in which they're creating interdisciplinary and connections. The people are just running back and forth across the hall. We, you know, we just the other day figured out all these really cool things you could print on the giant banner printer that's in the CAD lab. And so they, you know, went out and bought all kinds of fancy paper and are now making stickers on the walls that of banners and posters and planning murals. It's really very exciting. Yeah, the educational design that was a function of the architect's work to design the building was very well done. Really nice communication and a really good vision to start. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, Mr. Card. Thank you. Thanks for the great presentation. So I didn't get a chance to look through the whole plan um, today, but I um, uh, wanted to ask if there was something in there or if there's something that you're thinking of um, that's addressing the issue with the focal groups in our strategic plan, narrowing the gaps um so yes i mean so first of all heterogeneous grouping obviously mm -hmm. has had a substantial positive impact on focal groups um, academic conversations is a tier one intervention mm -hmm. so it's not targeted towards particular groups but as a um as an intervention sort of focusing on explicit teaching of conversation explicit teaching of behavioral skills it's one of it's some one of the strategies that is seen as being really positive for marginalized groups um, as well as for el students because you're building through the vocabulary and the conversation skills into the conversations um, i mean one of the things that off, often happens right with groups that feel less welcome in school is if the conversation is let's try to figure out what the teacher wants us to understand and let's try to sort of take this information that is not something I see myself in, then you're not going to have the same kind of connection. Whereas if the students are really probing and exploring their own ideas in the same way they get it in the arts, you have a higher level of engagement. Um, and then the targeted um, supports to students in midterms is very particularly focused on the students who are underperforming. And so it's going to make a particular difference for the focal groups. I can't remember what the third one. And then the culture and climate events are almost entirely focused, to be honest, mm -hmm. on DEI initiatives and diversity. Great, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Nope, I think we're ready for step two. Step two. All right, we also have Ms. Edson here on Zoom. I'm not sure how, if she's able to, she's wrong now. if she's there, able to unmute and talk or if she's otherwise occupied. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm here. I was able to multitask and put my kid to bed and I made it in time. I'm here. Fantastic. So if you need an assist, um, Dr. Danger, she's there and I'll drive for you. Awesome. Go ahead. So this is, we often have long conversations about this, but a relatively short presentation. Um, so this is just revisiting the fall um, data that we had before, now that we have more complete data for the fall. So, um, you know, we're, we, I always recap the outcomes evaluation plan so I can remember why we're having the conversation we're having. This review, so we have the quarter one grades, that's new information, and then the quarter one participation rates, that's old information. Um, but I figured I'd keep it all on the same slideshow. 
So as we said, we were going to look for higher levels of honors level participation, steady grades, um, improvement in rigorous expectations um, and outcomes on the panorama survey, future enrollment in honors, and then we'll look at the end of next year at MCAS scores to see if there's anything we can uh, discern from those. Um, so what we are, that's where we are now, the December presentation. I'll talk a little bit about items for consideration and next steps. And then there's a slide later that's a better next step slide. I didn't add it into that one, so we'll come back to that. So quarter one grades. Um, so that is the chart. The table's a little bit easier to read. Um, I scrunched down, I had an old boss who always made you, whenever you did percentage points, go from zero to 100, um, because she felt that it really um, distorted it when you <coughs> just squeezed it all in. But if you went from zero to 100, that just looked like a scrunch of everything in there together. I apologize for the fact that the year labels are in the middle. I could not figure out how to get them out. I did it last time, but I couldn't do it this time. Um, so the one thing to remember as you look across these is that they are not, each button is not a year. Um, you're comparing as you go from right to left, I'm going backwards. The most current grades is for the end of term one of this year. The next dot over is the end of last year. The comparable, comparable grades are the ones before that, which are the end of term one last year. And then going back two dots would be the end of term one the year before that. So there's a small decrease from 90.9 to 89 for the collective. Um, no, I'm sorry. Overall, there's a small decrease from it's the yellow one, the yellow band. So it's the yellow band from 87.8 to 86.8. Um, and you can see that that impact was um, primarily, in this case, coming from a small decrease in the honors level grades. Um, and there was an increase in the A level grades, which is interesting because one of the things that changed is that um, when, we were, when they were flat, flat grades actually meant that you had a large number of students that were now doing honors, even though the average was the same. What it looks like right now is that the, you know, a small cohort of students moved up to the um, honors that didn't do quite as well, um, so that those grades are sort of converging on one another. But overall, those are relatively stable grades. That's easier to read in terms of the numbers. So you can see um, the overall grade is 86.8, up from down from 87.8. Grades for honors went down a little bit and grades for H went up, A went up a little bit. And that is the punchline. If you break that out um, by race and ethnicity, the patterns are relatively similar. There was a drop for um, African-American students, um, which was, you know, again, higher than most years, but not great. Um, this is accompanied by the same group of students this year being lower in percentage than last year. Some of that, I think, has to do with a shift to for higher performance amongst multiracial students. Um, so I think some of that has to do with how students are reacting. I actually am going to sit down with Matt Coleman. He doesn't know this, but I'm going to sit down with Matt Coleman because I actually really want to reanalyze all of these based on um, making sure that we looking at the way in which race and ethnicity is calculated. Because race and ethnicity, the way it's calculated in all of these is as if they add up to 100%. Um, and they don't add up to 100% because of overlapping groups of students. And so I think if we're trying to look at the impact on African American students, um, we need to look at how we break out our multiracial students as well. So I'd like to come back over all the years and do that consistently for our final presentation. Um, so those are average grades by race and ethnicity, as you can see. Yeah, we already talked about that, and yeah, well, so we already talked about that. Um, and then by gender, that was relatively flat. If you go to the chart, it's a little easier to read. Um, the grades went up for young women, and they went down for young men, um, but they averaged out again to the same as everybody else. That's just there for reference. So that is basically that. Next slide. And so then just a quick tool for the participant rates. Do you guys need to hear the participation rates again, or have you all looked at them before? We're okay? All right, so that's our participation rates. And so that takes us to the very last slide. 
So items for consideration, um, as we've talked about before, um, there were three. I took one bullet out in terms for based on some of the conversations that I've been having with Dr. Holman and um, with Ms. Edson with the English department. Um, the English department's feedback is that the 10th grade teachers are enthusiastic about inclusive grouping. Um, and that there was also a conversation for the English 9 teachers about moving from the heterogeneous model as the grading structure to an honors for all structure. In the conversation we had, we felt like doing two things at once was going to be um, a little bit complicated, right? Because right now, if you're going to roll it from ninth grade to 10th grade, you want the ninth grade teachers to be able to educate the 10th grade teachers and what we've learned and where we're going. But if at the same time we're changing the curriculum and grading structure, um, we're kind of doing two things at the same time. So what we're sort of indicating right now is looking at piloting, sort of rolling the pilot forward for another year and considering the honors for all format. And Dr. Holman wanted to talk, I think, a little. Did you want to talk a little bit about the timing of how we were going to yeah, talk about so that? Yeah, so I think what, I, I think that goes actually to your next steps, but um, one of the, so these are the two items up for consideration, whether there is a continuation of inclusive English 9 grouping as it is currently formatted and structured, which as you recall, puts two groups, different groups of students who have opted into a different credit level um, and level of curriculum in one classroom, um, or whether to remove that sort of structural distinction and say, we will teach the rigorous curriculum with supports and differentiation to all students, which functionally the teachers have expressed, and I'm sure Ms. Edson can speak to um, is the way teachers feel they're approaching the curriculum now, and that has resulted in a much um, higher opt-in for uh, honors English. These items for consideration are um, restricted to English. They are restricted to English 9, and I think any further conversation about leveling practices at the high school need to be dovetailed with conversations about deeper learning at the high school, um, about instructional models at different grade levels, and about the feasibility of rolling out comprehensive uh, common planning capabilities for different groups of teachers, whether that's interdisciplinary or disciplinary, which would require major structural changes and obviously a lot more planning. Um, so why don't you talk through next steps, because I think this lays out kind of how we're thinking about timelines. Right. So <laughs> with those things under consideration, I think it would be really helpful for us to hear from um, ninth and 10th grade families who have been through the pilot and have some comparisons and can give us their information about their experiences as well as the eighth grade parents to hear about sort of their concerns and questions going forward. Um, and then the eighth, ninth, and 10th grade teachers would like to get together the ninth and eighth grade teachers in part to have the eighth grade teachers better understand what's going on in the ninth and 10th grade so that they can give some of the guidance that Ms. Morgan often sort of refers to in terms of making that really clear to the students. Um, but also I think to build back preparation for the classes that the students are going to go into based on a better understanding and then ninth and 10th grade teachers because there is work that can and should still be done in 10th grade that can learn from what was successful in ninth grade around having more consistent um, high expectations for all the students and more consistent and effective practices even if the students are remaining in um, leveled class structures um so we would do that and then in june um, I thought I, yeah, so I said January through March. Um, at some point, um, then in June, we would come back and share with you the final information. And in either March or June, that would be, be when we'd be looking for a decision from the school committee. Probably March. That's it. That's the last slide. Okay. Questions, comments? Ms. Morgan. Um, so in terms of the timing, I personally, as somebody who's watched three kids now make that eighth to ninth grade transition, I think it's really important that we know at the time that we're doing, that we're putting course selections out for eighth graders, what the structure is going to look like in ninth grade in English. So if it is going to be an honors for all, then um, I would like the message to the eighth graders to be, you are all taking honors English next year, you're gonna do great, <laughs> right? As opposed to having those eighth graders make some sort of artificial selection in power school, which they, for whatever reason, even this year, they still had to do it last year. They still had to pick a level, which starts to reinforce 
that sense of like, well, I'm an honor student or I'm not. And if, if they're all taking honors next year, if the current eighth graders are all taking honors in September, I, I want the message to them to be when they're doing their course selections that, that this is the only choice for you and it is the right choice for you. So I guess that's why I, I don't, it, depending on what happens, I, I would, I think that that course selection time is really important actually for eighth graders because I think it starts to set their sense of like, am I, am I not, what am I doing? So I hope that whatever is decided is sort of really clear. My preference would be that it's really clear at that point so that the messaging from the eighth grade teachers who are so, are so important to these kids, right, and how they perceive themselves, that the eighth grade teachers are clear about what's going to happen and they can give a clear message to the kids. Um, so that that's that's my feedback in terms of the timing and the next steps would be my strong preference. Okay, um, Ms. Hyten. You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I, I agree. I think that's one thing that we, um, as ninth grade teachers, wanted to make sure that we had the meetings with eighth grade teachers as early as possible to make sure that they, that all the messaging was aligned so that there was no um, discrepancies or confusions around what it would look like so that the teachers could <clears throat> confidently talk to the eighth grade students about it. Um, other questions, comments, Mr. Thelman? So I, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but notice the um, percent of honor students by gender. There's been a 50% increase in female students entering the honors, and there's been an increase by male students, but it's been about 20%. I don't know my, off the top of my head. So it, I'm just wondering, do you, do you, are you talking about that at all as a, as a faculty? About the problem with boys? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, yes. I mean, there are a lot of indicators, right, of boys having a harder time right now in schools, right? They right. have higher level of disciplinary issues. They've hired, um, there's been a shift in the last 10, 20 years. If you look at the very top students in terms of, you know, representation of the different genders. Um, it is, it is certainly something we are interested in in tracking. Um, and to be honest, academic conversations is not a bad strategy for addressing that um, as well in terms of engaging. Are there strategies you're pursuing? I mean, academic conversations is our big strategy yeah. right now. I mean, the strategies that we, people are working on for belonging and engagement are strategies which particularly are effective and helpful for boys. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we have a magic bullet or found something, but no, I nobody think, does. I mean, I think trend right now is, mm -hmm. but I mean, I, I think um, the strategies that deeper learning focuses on are, are strategies that are very much about like because a lot of the research about where boys are struggling right has to do with issues of identity and connection and who they are in school, um, and so strategies that are about making a personal connection to learning and having learning that more deeply affects your sense of identity and connection i think are, is going to be where we're going to get the most results do you think honors for all would be would be the right thing for for male students do you think that would actually have a positive outcome i do and yes. maybe just elaborate why why do you think that i mean in general, these inclusive strategies work best for the people who are least feeling least included, mm -hmm. right? And so um, if people are getting the message of I am this or I am that, and they're making those definitions of themselves in eighth or ninth grade based on the experiences they have, um, then saying to those boys, I expect that you can do ninth grade honors level work and that's the expectation we have and we're going to support you to do that and you're going to be participating in that and you know you talk to students and a lot of what make they think about correct me if i'm wrong but is like who the peers are in those classes do i have a right to be here is this a place i should be are these the kids i want to be with and so making sure that we're not dividing those students up right in the when they walk in the gate 
and slotting them into a set of expectations. And so all of those pathways that are disproportionately occupied by boys or minority students or SEL students, um, EL students, once you're on those pathways, it's harder to get off because you're not making the connections, you're not having the peer relationships. So, I mean, the strategy like honors for all is going to be particularly helpful for students who are less successful overall, but it's also going to be particularly helpful for those students who are already doing okay, but not really feeling belonging and engagement. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mr. Manick. Excuse me. Um, in, my ex in my experience, um, I found that having like a lot of different options for learning is really important. I think getting rid of A-level I think it would just it would take away options from people who like f like find that as the best fit for them. And I think one of the things that's really important about learning for me is like being able to like learn at your own pace, do what's best, what you like find is most comfortable for you. And I think just take I think ha only having honors could really negatively affect some people. Thank you, Mr. Schlickman. I'm really interested in tracking the. the improve success of students across the board in in the current uh, HGI. Um, the one caution I want to hit is that when we have the graphs breaking uh, broken out by demographics, school has a 3.2% African American population. So that if it's equally distributed across all four grades, and you have 432 ninth graders, uh, that's 13, 14 kids on average that you'd have, which is really small for uh, too small to have an, a cohort you can analyze on its own. So that I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I think it's important we take a look at it. But I think that there has to be a tremendous grain of salt in there because the, the numbers are small enough that any <clears throat> one or two kids in the cohort that are substantively different than kids in the preceding or following cohort are going to make the numbers look funny. Yes, for some of those small groups, the numbers fluctuate very, very broadly from year yeah. to year. So I just want to make sure that we're understanding that there's cohort error in there because of the small numbers and that we shouldn't really be It's something to be aware of, but it's not, not something we should be drawing conclusions from. I think that what's happened here, I think we've seen, and I also, let me ask another question philosophically. Um, in terms of teacher grading, I wonder if as we're moving forward, teachers are thinking differently about how they're, how they're assigning this number grade, which really doesn't make a lot of sense in, in a lot of aspects onto a kid. What does that number grade mean? And it ha has that sort of changed over the past couple of years? Grades are a mathematical solution to a philosophical problem. <laughs> um, and uh, we could take a lot more than tonight to talk about grading. And I actually want to respond to what you said, because I think it's important to note that part of the reason why, actually the fundamental reason why we did heterogeneous grouping the last two years mm -hmm was because when we had the study group, the students, many of them felt the way that you felt, right? That there was a real concern about sort of being, even within a heterogeneously grouped class, being able to choose the A-level of curriculum. Um, and so, you know, the result has been that the participation in honors level curriculum in those classes has gone from around 50% to around 65, 70%. Um, but some students are still choosing the A-level curriculum. So if we're going to structure an honors for all curriculum, it needs to be one which takes into account kind of what is the level of adventure the student is choosing in that class. And that is going to be, that's part of why this, there needs to be substantial work done. Honors for all does not mean that you just flip the switch and everyone's in what they're currently experiencing in other honors classes. Honors for all is not just, you can't go to any class anymore, right? Honors for all is a, is a different way of thinking about sort of how you're doing the standards so that students know clearly what their expectations are to hit 
you know, a meet standard grade, which would be a B. Mm -hmm. And it's built around sort of a more standards-based approach to what it is you're doing grading on. And I can't go into much more detail on that because there's a lot of thinking that would have to go into on, in on the part of the teachers about how that would look and what that would do so that <clears> students <throat> are supported appropriately and have an opportunity to move at the pace that's appropriate for them. Because a lot of our current honors classes are very focused on pace and retention and independence of work. And if that's what you're doing in honors for all, that would not be really successful for the students that we've often talked about who are in curriculum A, want a higher level of support and don't want to move at that level of pace. Other questions, comments? I guess I just want to respond two things. One, I think I appreciate what Mr. Minnick said because I'm thinking about my children that at times they would have they would want to do a tough science, you know, a, a higher level science and a lower level English because they were trying to balance their schedule and balance their life. And so I think that's a really good point to be able to have some and also doing doing it without destroying their GPA, which for right now still holds weight with colleges and, and stuff. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask, and I apologize that I didn't bring this up before, and maybe we can just get the information later, is I think one of the purposes that we heard of this when we first started discussing it was that there was an anticipation that students would continue to take honors if they had had it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering what has been the experience this year at the <clears throat> sophomore level? You know, mm -hmm. how, what are the splits there? Mm -hmm. So sophomore level, it has maintained. There are, the percentage of students that went on to take sophomore honors is about the same. It's about 65% as it was last year. So six, last year, six, yeah, so the, I saw Nicole put a hand up too. I don't know so the percentage of students who took honors last year in English nine, Right. That mm -hmm. same percentage is taking honors at 10th grade. Right, but what level. did they do before? Which was a higher than the, the cohort before was more of like 10th grade. 50. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the percentage in 10th grade is going up 10th grade year over 10th grade year, but the Correct. cohort rate maintained is mm -hmm. what you're Correct. saying. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. Okay. Sightson? Is Sightson? Edson? Thank you. Um, I think another thing that we wanted, the teachers also wanted to get um, some feedback from, from the current 10th grade students um, to see what their experience had been between, because, because the, the current 10th grade students um, went back into the, uh, the leveled classes um, when in ninth grade, they were part of that first year of pilot, the pilot. So we wanted to get a sense of if there was some sort of survey or some way that we could find out how their experience from the ninth to 10th grade, um, you know, going back into, um, or going to leveled from unleveled, if that makes sense, um, what, what that's like, what that's been like, would be helpful information for us. Ms. Cole, are you? Um, I guess I'm just a little bit confused because I'm taking a, like a mixed level English class right now as a senior and I took a mixed level French class last year as a junior. So if it's not just in grade nine, why is the focus on grade nine? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, so the reason the focus is on grade nine is because, that's an interesting question. So the reason the focus is on grade nine is because in terms of the response of the community to the proposal that we start to expand heterogeneous grouping, there was a large concern. The idea was that we would start in, in grade nine during, I mean, the back, the back history was that during COVID, ninth, all, almost all of the classes were heterogeneously grouped. Um, and that after that, teachers in ninth and 10th grade, English history and science requested to maintain that, to continue to do heterogeneous grouping at that level. But there's a lot of concern in the community about whether our curriculum, our teachers, and our grading practices were really ready to do that. Um, and so there was a conversation then about, you know, where that might be most appropriate to do, where we might be most successful at it. 
-hmm. And part of why we ended with heterogeneous grouping as the structure mm -hmm. was because it was, like you said, something that we're already pretty familiar with elsewhere in the school and lots of other classes. If I may, one of the other things is the ninth grade English initiative was a core course that every student coming through Arlington High School has to do as opposed to being an elective where you don't have to do it and if you want to take it, you can do it in, with the understanding that those are the conditions that you'll be working in. And you folks are welcome to leave when you want, but you're also <laughs> welcome to stay. <laughs> We're glad you're here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, I guess I'm just concerned about the timing that if we're making decisions in March, I'm concerned that we're getting a lot of information in June. And I'd like to, I'm just worried about, I, I wanna see the information before making the decision. So maybe if you and Dr. Holman can talk about how that might be managed. It's an awkward timeline because there's certain information that we simply won't have until June and then there's the need to decide what the plan's going to be for next year. We kind of knew this when we walked into a two year pilot that we wouldn't actually have results from MCAS for this group. Um, and there's definitely a desire at the very least to move the pilot forward and to assess the impact of trying out um, a curriculum that gives everybody access to the higher expectation. I will point out that I think some of the impetus for that comes both from conversations with the ninth grade teachers about what the next phase of this is and from conversations we had when we first started this and the committee was divided on whether or not to go with an honors for all proposal or a heterogeneously group proposal similar to what we were already doing in the high school and the fact that we're hearing from our el educators in the pilot the elementary level what a huge impact it has to give all kids access to that rigorous um, content and then really examine how we're making sure we scaffold and close gaps for students who may have skill gaps that they weren't quite ready for that level of content because they hadn't been taught tenses um, before fifth grade. So we're trying to learn from all of that and crafting a proposal for this and recognize that we need to have some conversations with families and students and teachers in the interim before we can craft a really well done proposal. I think we will have a proposal in March for how to move forward with this. Um, for exactly the reason Ms. Morgan mentioned, which is that eighth grade students need to not be confused walking into their ninth grade experience. Um, and that that will be for the committee's vote and consideration. And then we will still continue to collect these data, probably add some data points that we want to continue to track if we move forward with any adjustments to the model um, and get the committee's feedback on those data points so that we can keep coming back and reporting on them as we move forward. And then I think there's a desire for there to be a shift towards, for away you know, from thinking about this as the HGI pilot into next year and towards thinking about what the next phase of deeper learning at the high school and instructional models at the high school needs to be. If I, I misspoke. All sounded good to me. Okay. I mean, the only thing I would say is in terms of timeline, students really start doing those decisions January, February. So if we're waiting on the there's two conversations we could be having. One is the if conversation, and one is the how conversation. The if conversation, if we want to be able to tell people what we think we're gonna do next year, needs to be January, February. Um, the how conversation is, is one that we can take a lot more time in a more reflective way to explain sort of what the rationale and, and logic behind that is. Um, and that, to be honest, is not for me, a particularly educational, like the educators have been working on this for a long time. We have some pretty good experience with this. I think we know where we think we would be going, but there is sort of a political and community conversation that we've been having for a couple of years now in terms of what people are comfortable with. So that, I mean, for us, we can have a conversation about what sort of information we could give you in a timely fashion, but it's not gonna be everything if it's something that has to happen by February. Okay. Just, just to clarify, so, I mean, we would be, the vote we would be taking would be in the approval of the AHS handbook on uh, honors for all, for, right, or not. <clears throat> so, I mean, I think, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what political considerations mean. I think what we, <laughs> we'd want, I would want anyway, is a recommendation from the superintendent and the team 
that this is the best way forward and why. And I would like it vetted by the curriculum committee before it comes to us. That's like the process that I would like. Yeah. So I mean, is that, so I'm not sure the political considerations is, I'm not sure what that means or community considerations. So I just want to say that go through our process, recommendation by the experts. We it's vote. Our next meeting. It's the next meeting. So Dr. Jager, eighth grade course selection comes in when? Probably no better than I do. Um, they used to ask us for it before the end of second term, which well, that was when they asked teachers for recommendations. <clears throat> okay. Which was, and before the end of January. Okay. Um, they're not doing recommendations anymore. So February. Yeah, I mean, we meet with we, we have our parent thing where we explain to the parents. <laughs> um, the January we uh, do our eighth grade presentation to the students. Um, end of January, mm -hmm. and then the information starts coming in in February because, um, and it's all, some of that is a matter of just how quickly we can build the structure of the decision thing. Okay. As a parent of two ninth graders, the email came from Mr. McCarthy on Sunday, February 19th, and the portal opened for scheduling on February 20th. Okay, that's more Which the is, timeline I had yeah. in my mind. Okay, yeah. so, so I, I, I said March, March but, but that's that, that, that's, that's not, not March. February. <laughs> so, okay, I had early March in my mind, and that's not early March either. No. Um, so I well, think- And we would like to get it out earlier, just sometimes the technical yeah. thing. We, we've felt strongly that it's important that we do some engagement with families, with eighth grade families, ninth grade families, um, about whatever the proposal is going to be before we nail down a proposal for this meeting, which is part of why you're getting the possibilities, not the proposal at this meeting. Um, I think we need to convene around timeline and talk with Mr. Marringer and Mr. McCarthy about when they need to get those ninth grade course selections in so that we can make sure we're in front of that in our discussions with families. And so then we will figure out a timeline talk to Dr. Al Stampy about when we will come back with a proposal for the school committee's consideration. It probably won't be with the program of studies. There might be a placeholder in the program of studies and a separate conversation a couple of weeks later. Except when are we, when are you going to do the feedback from grade eight, grade nine? In between. In between. Okay. So you were Yeah. Which is, that. which is to say okay. we don't have time between when we yeah. do the high school yeah. program yeah. of no, studies okay. to do that. And so we need a little more time to do that. Okay. Just, just one clarification. So the superintendent talked about the idea of giving everybody access to higher level materials and, and curriculum. That's what's happening in the whole HGI initiative, right? So we're not changing that or deciding how to change that. We're talking about the assessments that they're being given and the work that they're being given to do and whether that's going to be uniform or split. Because that's the only difference right now between A and H are the assessments. Is that right? I mean, it's not the assessments, it's the structure of the standards. Yeah. Um, the grading standards. No, the learning standards is a difference um, in terms of what the expectations are for student learning. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I think the teachers, and, and Nicole is much better talking about this than I am, so I should probably talk and stop, but <clears throat> I won't. Um, one of the, <laughs> One of the things for the, the teachers are talking about is that there's sort of this mental gymnastics. We've been doing it, right? that it's like, I'm doing honors, but I'm not doing more. We've, we've sort of had this decision that it's not supposed to be you're doing a lot of different work or an additional project. It's that we're all working towards a common standard. And so then what does this mean that you're doing it honors and I'm doing it A? And that it in many ways is a lot cleaner to have everybody participating in the same thing with different levels of performance. Um, and clearer sets of expectations. It's not a fluid choice right now. It's a structural one. Right. The, the latitude, and I would invite Ms. Edson to add to this, that you give when you make that a fluid choice within a classroom gives a student a lot more opportunity to opt for the higher level learning when that's when it's connected to their passions or the choice they've made around a topic. And it also gives the teachers a lot more ability to differentiate. And I think they've experienced what happens when you structurally differentiate within a classroom and thinking through this and then we end up doing this in mental gymnastics Dr. Jane was talking about. And Ms. Edson, do you want to talk about it a little? Yeah, I mean, you've hit on a lot of the points, so I, I don't I don't really um, I don't want to be too repetitive, but I think that the whole idea of trying to separate something 
between H and A, like, okay, what's an A, what's, what's a, what's an A, right? Like what's, what's an A at A level, <laughs> what's, or what's a B at A level versus what's a, what's an A at honors level, um, rather than like, this is the standard of learning that we're, that everyone is participating in. And then some, you know, some people are, some students are hitting this level of the standard. Some students are hitting this level of the standard. Um, to use Dr. Jenger's word, it's cleaner when you have the idea, like we're all working in the same curriculum. Um, this Everyone has access to this, this rigorous cu curriculum with supports in place, um, but we're not trying to figure out like, what does it mean when you're an H level student with this versus an A level? You know, it's especially when we're not making it about um, pacing or the amount of work, right? That that's we've really gotten away from that completely when it comes to H versus A level. That's not what um, honors level work is. Is more work. Mr. Schultz, so ultimately, we're looking at a situation where the current eighth graders are going to either be, unless we go and scrap the whole thing, which I don't think we're going to do. They're either going to be in ninth grade English, which will be sectioned is a heterogeneously grouped. And when they get in the classroom, they're gonna sort A to H, or they're gonna be in ninth grade English where our teaching philosophy is gonna be honors for all. So there's really nothing to choose from for an eighth grader looking at the course selections. The, the, the button you're gonna push is grade nine English and that's that for everybody. So uh, maybe we're a little anxious about that part of it when from a practical standpoint for a kid in ninth grade in eighth grade right now that that is correct we so, could but, can I, we have had yeah, go ahead. Still, sure. so but the the mechanics of it mm -hmm. mr schlickman are that because of the desire on the part of the high school to sort of evenly distribute students who are taking so Mm -hmm. Because of the way the schedule works, right, if I, I believe if you just sort of rolled the dice, you could end up with a classroom where there are 90% of kids who are electing to take honors mm -hmm. and 10% of them are electing to take curriculum A, which is like totally not what the intention of this is. But if, if students put in in February, like this is my best guess of where I'm going to be. They get, they get equally distributed, distributed like, like roughly, roughly amongst all of the different mm -hmm. cohort sections. They can change their selection. In fact, they don't make their actual selection until like the end of September. Mm -hmm. But last year I had two eighth graders and when they went in power school, mm -hmm. they had to pick apparently in February, which is amazing to me. I don't remember it being February, but clearly was. They had to pick, I'm gonna take honors or I'm gonna take curriculum A at that, at that point, point so that, so that as AHS, AHS built, built the schedule, schedule they could, you know, yeah, those, those kids could be distributed to some extent. Would, would there be another marker in there for another course that could be used as a default in that for, for sorting? So honestly, I don't think we need to ask anymore. When we did this originally, part of our question was, just from a data collection point of view, we were interested in what they thought they were gonna do versus what they did. Um, and then we wanted to be able to look and say, did something terrible and untoward happen? And something terrible and untoward happened, didn't happen. We did not reshuffle kids by hand in any way. We let the computer shuffle it out. Um, so, you know, The real thing to do is to make sure actually that you just accurately distribute your geometry classes um, and then everything else works out just fine. Um, and so I don't think we need to collect that at all. And I think given the conversations you've had about sort of the stresses that creates for people, I think we probably won't. So just, just so I'm, so the, there's like three choices, right? We're talking about English nine. We can, we could kill the pilot and go back to having whatever we did. I don't even know two years ago, FY, whatever, right? Where yeah, if you're in English, honors you're in room 221 and if you're in curriculum a english you're in room 222 so that would be like axing the pilot we could continue the pilot potentially not calling it a pilot anymore <laughs> um, and continue to have 
heterogeneous group whereby <coughs> students receive either curriculum A or curriculum H credit within the same classroom, or we could go to a situation where students um, all receive honors credit for English in ninth grade. So, so those are like, that, those are the three options. And we're right now we're looking at ninth grade. And, and, but those are the three, those are th our three, the three choices. Okay. That's what I thought, just wanted, to, <laughs> it's getting late. So I wanted to be clear. Thank you. So we will bring a recommendation and we will figure out a timeline between the three of us that works for that. Okay. Great. So oh, any other questions? Nope. Okay, we're good. Thank you very Thank you. much. Sorry to keep you so long. <laughs> but it was a good discussion. Mm -hmm. And now we have Ms. Keese um, with the AEA budget priorities. Do you have my link? I do. Okay, because I've been tweaking, so. All right. Do you want me over there? Well, no. Can you see? Can you see? I can see. I'm. I got it on my screen too. Goodbye, yeah, Dr. Jenger and Ms. Ed's, oh, she already left. Um, this is updated from what's in Novus. What's yeah, in a little. Okay. I mean, it's the, the gist of it is the same, but every year I, you know, make a list, and this is on my like list of things to do over the weekend for next Thursday, and then I get the email on like Tuesday that says we need that by Friday, and I have an absolute panic attack. <laughs> So it was, it was rough on Friday, um, but thank you all so much. Oh, plus we had some breaking news that I had to you know, work in here. So um, thank you for giving me a chance to talk about the AEA budget priorities for APS. This is a little harder to do in a negotiations year than it was last year. So please bear with me. I tried to get all of my numbers as straight as I could. Um, we ended last year by saying, if we can dream for a moment, and talked about maybe increasing our paraprofessional salary so we could still you know, fill some positions. So I'd like to start today by saying, hey, dreams come true sometimes. Um, and we have a tentative agreement for our unit D contract. Uh, and we want to say that we are incredibly grateful to the Arlington, Arlington community for their increased financial support for higher staff salaries. Um, we are really, really excited in the AEA right now. It's a good, it's a good week for us. So thank you for making that happen. Thank you for being willing to think outside the lines and think outside the box and do some amazing things for our staff and our students. So um, so our process this year was pretty similar to last year. We um, had meetings on November 1st at each work site to gather feedback from our staff. Um, we tied that in with feedback towards negotiations as well this year. Um, and then our reps took their findings, they shared it out with our board of directors, we made up a master list, and then we sent out a survey that said, these are the, these are the things we're hearing from you that are a priority, how would you rank them? Um, and you can see here, in, increased compensation was the, the most important issue for 75% of our staff. So um, that is the focus of where we are. We also talked to other local unions to establish comps in the region. Uh, we have our town manager 12, we're also working closely with some bordering towns. Um, and consulting with local leadership to make sure we're aligning our priorities. So what I've come up with is roughly 1.5 million in recommended increases plus salaries to be negotiated for unit A and D. Um, and that's split between increased compensation, um, additional training for new paraprofessionals, uh, increased special education staff, improved technology, and some stuff I'm calling miscellaneous because I really tried to price these out and I, I I'll, I'll, I'll get there, um, as well as looking at capital improvements that we're recommending and sort of our big dreams again. So compensation is our first one. We know all this. We know Arlington um, is among the lower paid districts in our competitive pool, especially at the top of the unit A pay scale. We know that that's affecting us by helping, making it harder for us to attract qualified candidates. It's making us hard to attract a diverse candidate pool. And we're actually, it should, it should say, say we're say losing highly qualified, qualified not just candidates, candidates but staff. staff like we have, we have people leaving arlington to go work in other districts, districts that pay more and they're, they're very upfront that the reason they're going is because they're getting paid more um and how much is that going to cost that's going to depend on negotiations um but i can tell you that three areas that people talk about a lot are salaries parental leave and the hourly work rate. um so, so where are we getting the money for that? Oh, well, we passed an override. 
So, so I don't, I don't want, want to get, get too much in the weeds of negotiations things, things but that, that is the, the primary, primary area of focus for our staff. For our staff. Um, um, some, some other areas, areas uh, uh, training for new paraprofessionals, we saw this last year as well. Um, we are thankful to the district to hiring um, Kate Parrots, who's doing a lot of onboarding work and designing programming for us. So we're really hopeful that next year this will be up and running, that we can have orientation for new hires, that we can get our new hires trained before they walk into the room with the kids. Um, and this is a, you know, a carryover request from last year that we think still needs some attention. Um, next up is special education. Um, this is our biggest non-direct like salary compensation increase. Um, and it, it's, we are doing some amazing work in Arlington in improving inclusion education, um, in keeping more kids in district and keeping kids who are in district in mainstream classes. And it's awesome. And it's having real positive benefits for our students. And it's a lot of work. And we want to make sure that we have the staff to support that. Um, what we're, you know, it, one, One example, example we see is, is at the middle school, middle school level, level um, we have we a have lot of kids who have co-taught co written onto their IEP grid, grid so there has to be a special educator in the room as long as the, with the general education teacher. And what ends up happening is you get a really high concentration of special ed kids in one room because we only have so many special ed teachers who can push in. So if we can increase more special education staff, we can increase inclusion and push in support. We think that that's really going to be beneficial. I know some specific principals have asked for special ed teachers um, based on their areas of need. So we definitely support that. We would love to see another teacher in every building. I don't know if that's feasible, but that would be amazing. I think that's the goal we strive towards. If it takes a few years to roll that out, it's worth it. Um, the other thing that we have talked about in the past is trying to shift some work off of the people who are working directly with the students um, one way we could, we're recommending we do that is to have an evaluation support team. So people in some of our roles that do a lot of testing um, that could float through the district. They could, you know, if needed, back up absences in hard these hard to fill areas, but they could alleviate some of the testing burden that is currently falling to our liaisons who are losing time working with kids to do a lot of this pull out testing. Um, and, and some, some unit C work. work. Um, I, was I was in a meeting, meeting this week where they talked about how it's really hard to get some numbers out of easy IEP because every year somebody has to go in and like take a particular student and like uncheck the teachers that don't work with them anymore and then check off all the new teachers who work with them anymore. And we're paying peace pe people with master's degrees at the top of the salary to sit and check boxes for every student on an IEP. Mm -hmm. And if there's some way that we could put some unit C positions to support special education, that's a lot more time that those highly qualified people can be working with students and not checking boxes in a computer. So, um, so that's, that's a good chunk of money. If we get more from Student Opportunity Act, that can be used for high need students. So that's where I would recommend that coming from. Um, but that's something that special ed across the board is an area that we hear the most need from. Uh, in terms of technology, we still need more spare Chromebooks. Um, if you walked into my classroom last week, uh, you, uh, would you would have seen me sitting, sitting on my phone, my phone and, and it's a bad, bad look, look, but I had, I had to hand my, my device, device to a computer so that he could do the, the classwork that we were doing because his Chromebook had broken and there were no more spares in the office. So at that point, the option is the kid doesn't participate that day or I hand him my computer and then if I have to email an administrator, I have to sit on my phone and do it. Um, we, kids are, well, first of all, the stuff we bought in 2020 is wearing out. And this, these things take a beating. Um, and, and kids, kids, you know, they, stuff, stuff gets dropped, dropped. Stuff, stuff gets shoved, shoved in the backpack, backpack and then stepped on by somebody who's, you know, know trying to get to the tissues. tissues. Um, we, we just, just need, need to have, have more extras, extras in the buildings. Um, um, and, and we need to buy Chromebooks for all of our paraprofessionals. Uh, we did this during the hybrid year. Every paraprofessional had a device. We've sort of gotten away from it, partly because we had to pull them all back in and distribute them to students, but, or we've hired new people and didn't have a device to give them. Uh, we do PD. We all of our sign up for PD was on computers, but we were telling people to sign up and we didn't have computers for them to use to sign up. They had to like borrow somebody else's. Um, we have a lot of our paraprofessionals are collecting data on students and behavior and that kind of thing. Our buildings function by email. 
So when we have a cohort of people who are supporting our neediest students and they don't have a way to check email during the day, we don't even have like desktops in the libraries anymore. So, um, and we send out things like the panorama survey. So everybody tell us how you're feeling about this, but we don't give them a device to take the survey on. So we really need our paraprofessionals to have we're saying Chromebooks. I mean, if you want to buy them on MacBooks, that would be amazing. Um, but a Chromebook would be great. And our, most of our projectors at this point use Apple TV. So if we're going to get Paris Chromebooks, we may, should make sure that all the classrooms have dongles that can hook up to the projectors. It's because the Chromebook doesn't talk to the Apple TV. And we have a lot of like Paris will sub and they'll cover for classes. And we want to make sure that they can, you know, use the projectors and that kind of thing. Um, so, so I don't, I don't, I don't know of any funding, funding sources we can use to buy technology, technology um, except, except that that's that just sort of a capital operating increase that I think in our one-to-one -one district is necessary. Uh, my miscellaneous, this is where we get off the rails because, uh, yeah. Um, teachers in this district really want more tier two general ed interventions available to students before they go on to IEPs. We have reading support in most of our schools. We have math interventionists or math support classes in most of our schools. We have some executive functioning groups that counselors run in different spots in the district. Um, we don't have much, we don't really have any targeted writing intervention at all besides what's going on in the classroom. And that is an area of real serious need. Writing was the thing teachers identified as taking the biggest hit during the pandemic. Um, if you look at our MCAS scores, writing is where we're lowest. Um, and it's, it's a huge area on IEPs as a goal area. You know, students need help in writing. So if we can find a way to do more targeted writing intervention, that would really help. We have a couple of gems in the district. Um, the AHS Learning Center model, where kids can go in and get help on individual assignments without, um, being on an IEP, like it's available for any kid to drop in. That's awesome. It would be great if we could roll that down. Gibbs is doing some really cool pilot stuff with their win block where they're um, sorting the kid, like the kids are, rather than just randomly scheduling them in, the teachers are sort of spending some time observing the kids and then making some flexible groupings and doing some targeted intervention with who needs what, what they need at this time. Um, but you know, if their enrollment goes up next year, I don't know if they're going to be able to continue that. So we really would like to see the district investing in more of this tier two intervention. Um, I know some of the elementary teachers have said they need more reading teachers. So this, this is an area we'd like the district to be focusing some money on. I don't know how to price that out. I don't know how much it is. I don't know how many people. I don't know how many places. I'm just saying that this is an area we would like to see some investment. Um, second, Eliminating the AMPM fees at the middle school. Um, the high school got rid of their club and athletic fees. The elementary got rid of their music fees. We're still charging kids at the middle school to be in clubs. So I tried to go through that thousand page budget and find out how much this costs and I couldn't find it in there. I think it's part of bigger revolving accounts. Um, I spent a lot of time with that budget this past week, I'm telling you. Um, but we pay teachers $19 a day for supervising activities and students pay $320 a year or $80 a quarter to participate. If there's any way we could get rid of this, this would allow more kids to participate in clubs. We, and I think that that would really help with that like feeling of belonging. Um, so that's a recommendation from our, both our Gibbs and our Audison teachers. And then finally, um, like Dr. Jenga was saying, there are staffing areas um, where, where enrollment is going up and we need more staff. So like uh, ML teachers, AHS, um, and that's just to help us keep class sizes manageable. I will add one more relevant story to the writing intervention. I had a kid in my room a couple of years ago during a prep period. She was with me and two other teachers <coughs> sobbing that she was going to fail art. And we're like, well, honey, nobody fails art. Why are you going to fail art? She couldn't figure out how to write her artist statement because that wasn't like the type of art, they, the type of writing she'd learned how to do. And she didn't have a template for it. And we're asking kids to do a lot of writing in a lot of unexpected places. And nobody should worry they're going to fail art because they can't figure out how to write an artist statement. Um, so we, that, that's, he was talking about that. And I was thinking about that poor girl. So um, writing intervention. All right. Um, 
HVAC, HVAC updates, updates and repair, repair. Um, climate, um, climate control, control, control is still an issue in several of our buildings. buildings. Audison, Audison still has those cold zones in the office, the lobby the classrooms, classrooms, the music room. room. Um, Bishop, Bishop had, had some heat failures this fall. fall that, that are, the problem is our device, our, our infrastructure's, infrastructure's old, old. So like when like something goes, goes, they have they to like, like they can't just bring it apart and replace it. They have to like take the part out and go fix the part, and it takes a while, and then it's cold and. And Dallin, and Dallin still, still has hot and cold zones as well, as well and, and they have their, their chiller chill units, units tend to flood things. things. So, so um, you know, yeah, that's, that's something we'd like the district paying some attention to. to. And, finally, and finally, the very, very hot, hot classrooms, classrooms in the early fall and late spring. spring. Um, um, we, we appreciate that we close when it gets really hot, hot and it feels unsafe. unsafe. We don't, don't want to have to do that. Fans don't work very well when it's up in the 90s. They're great if it's like, you know, 75, but they're not great when it's up in the 90s. Portable AC units do. Um, the, kind the kind that you can just, just stick, stick out the out window. window. Uh, uh, and I don't know what our electrical systems, systems will allow for us running a whole bunch of those. those. Right. right. But, you know, you know if, if there's, there's a way, a way to increase, increase the, number the number of cooler spaces, spaces if, if not every, every space, space could be cool, be cool maybe, maybe we could keep some more of the buildings open when it's really hot. So, um, and, and since it worked so well last year, if we could dream for a minute here, are staff daycare is at capacity? Um, and um, and but this, this is, is a huge draw for our teachers. teachers and, and if, if there's, there's any way, way to expand, expand it, it, um, it, it, it would help, help keep more people, people in district. district. Um, I, I, I have I had, had teachers, teachers tell, tell me that, that the, the first, first person, person they told were pr they, they were pregnant, pregnant was, was Sue in the, in the Arlington daycare. Because like you get your name on the wait list immediately. So, so just, just thinking, thinking when we're thinking, thinking about, about sort of what what, what can we do, what do, what do, what do teachers, teachers want, want, this comes up a lot. Um, um, and then, and then you, know, you know, we're still working on proposals for negotiations, negotiations but, but we'd like all those to happen, happen too. too. So. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't know if people have any questions about any of this or add one thing to this last slide. <laughs> sure. Which is that the before after care for monotomy preschool in particular, I heard from a group of parents who have kids in the daycare who are we've been working on the model for monotomy, which needs to be prioritized for Arlington residents. And so, you know, in the move from Parmenter to the new monotomy, one of the adjustments we're making is that the rec center is going to get access to Parmenter and they're looking at a very large expansion of their pre K program um, with spots designated for staff of the town of Arlington and Arlington Public Schools with expanded hours that are actually going to be better for our teachers than monotomy preschool. So I'm really excited about that collaboration with the rec department because it's going to expand some pre-K capacity in town um, and give more options to some of our staff. It doesn't really help the daycare. They do have a big cohort now that's now headed into preschool. So hopefully it will help that cohort have a preschool option because it's not all going to be monotomy. You know, just, a, just a couple uh, comments and, and question. Um, so thank you for this. It's always good to hear what, what the AA <laughs> thinks about. Um, you know, fortunately, we've got the override pass. We do have some money coming in over the next two years. Um, but after that, all bets are off. Yes. So I do think we need to be very judicious on how we're expanding things and adding things, knowing that that could get easily have to be pulled back, which would be unfortunate. So. Um, so just, I, I think as, as a committee, we need to think about that. So all of these things sound wonderful, but I don't know that we'll be, even if we had the money to do it next year, I don't know that we would want to do it and then just pull it back two years later. So, uh, related to that, one of the things that's not on the list, um, but I know has been in the past is support for DEI type initiatives. And we, we do have a proposal in, from the, the administrative team to add another position there. Is, is that something that, that came up in your conversations or is that less of a need these days now that we have two people in that department? I know that that department is stretched very, very thin as it is. Um, and I know that there's still work to be done there. We didn't really talk about adding particular positions. What really, the special ed piece came from our special ed staff saying we are dramatically overworked. Um, so that's why we, we put those recommendations in there. Um, but I think, I, I know that the two people in our DEI department would love some more help, and we would definitely support that. Um, I, 
I didn't think it was like on the cutting block, so I didn't emphasize it. But yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, Mr. So I'm really interested in your talking about professional development for the paraprofessionals. Mm. I, 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 as a principal and a teacher, I, I don't think anybody ever, ever teaches teachers how to work with another adult in the room. Because mm -hmm. I never learned that in, in undergrad, and it's something that I had to learn when all of a sudden, here's your para, yeah. you know. And it's building a relationship, it's working. It, I, it was a struggle, mm -hmm. and and I and when when I was a principal, I looked at our powers, and, and they they struggled with what their role was in in what to do and in, in how to interact with the rest of the building as well. Yep. And so that to I, I think that districts overall need to think very carefully about respecting the work of the paraprofessional, making sure that that's honored so that they feel that, that they're valued. I mean, one of the things that I've seen in Lowell when I was doing all the analysis is that the, the biggest attendance issues among our district employees were, were the paras because it's strenuous, you're in a lot of contact with kids, which means you're in a lot of contact with kid-borne viruses. Okay. And there, there's also that really sense of a lot of responsibility, but really lack of caring on one level. So I, I think that anything we can do besides the good news of being able to increase salaries to make it more competitive, to, to make it feel more valued by the district yep. and, and the school community would be essential. Okay. I heard yesterday about the onboarding they're doing for the new science teacher at Gibbs and how they spent like a good chunk of time, like walking her around to meet all the people in the building and giving her some time to observe the different classrooms. And like, it sounded like such a model for like, this is how we want to onboard people mm -hmm. um, that I would love to like replicate that because the para positions also are the most likely to be brought on in the middle of the year. Mm -hmm. So they miss out on the summer stuff that most of the other new hires do. I've, I've always been impressed with your presentations, and I thank you for Thanks. your input. Okay, great. Moving on, uh, the financial report, Mr. Mason. Do you want me to pull anything up? Yes. Yeah. I've got it. It's a, it's a, it's a no question. Yeah, I got it. Go ahead. Yes. Not that one. Not that one? That's the one I'm nervous. Okay, hold on. Good evening. <laughs> Start up, sorry. Oh, there is. Okay, got yeah. it. Good evening. So uh, I'll discuss the financial report number two. Uh, or these, these are the finances as of um december 11th 2023 um and and included um in the memo that you would have received um before the meeting um and i'll be talk, touching upon just the summary of, of the memo um is the general the, uh, the general fund report which is the town appropriation which includes uh you know the local appropriation that includes chapter 70 state aid revolving in special revenue grants um, which include entitlement grants um should include COVID. but um i do think that COVID was mistakenly left off for this month's report so i will provide an update um with the updated report later on um so the the general funds at a glance uh, so Currently, we're around. We have about twenty-nine point three million dollars spent between salaries and um, vendor payments, um, and we still have about fifty-eight point six million dollars encumbered um, with projected <laughs> additional projected activity, um, which would include um, departments. I'll, I'll actually, we'll go on on the next slide, but um, it'll, it'll include more of department spending and some um, transfers. Um, leaving with a projected balance of two hundred and twenty-four thousand um, dollars, 
Um, this does not include any anticipated increase um, of budget um, that we've got, that we're expecting from the override. Um, so with additional $400,000 uh, that is we're anticipating, that will um, increase that anticipated balance. Um, the projected activity includes um, about 2.1 in additional department spending right now, $2.1 million. And then we are we do have to do an out of district transfer to the circuit breaker fund, about 1.9 million. Um, there's about $83,000 that uh, we've identified that needs to be transferred to SR3 that were budgeted positions that should have been charged directly. Um, and then there are some food service related uh, expenditures uh, tied to monitoring that's sitting on the general fund that will be transferred to the food service uh, revolving fund. Um, then there's some additional identified expenditures that are sitting in the projected activity. Um, um, approximately uh, about twenty to $30,000 is being held for additional furniture um, that may be used in equipment that may be used up on, in the central offices here, included in the space. Um, we are running high on electricity this year, um, mainly driven by the, the, the high school building, still trying to work out the kinks. Um, and we also anticipate that the additional phase is going to be, uh, is running lar larger than what we were anticipating um, the estimates to show. Um, so that's running around total around $1.8 million. And then um, as uh, Ms. Julie Keyes spoke about, um, about uh, our tentative agreement, there is a hold for the paraprofessional salary adjustments in this budget, um, in this report. Uh, also, moving on to the revolving funds, um, just the reported revolving funds, these are not all of the revolving funds, but um, we're, we have, we're on a starting balance of 4.6 million. Um, and we're reporting right now about $614,000 in collected revenue at this point in time and about $582,000 that's been spent with an additional $541,000 that we're anticipating to spend along with uh, the net of spending and collections, leaving a projected balance of these funds for around $4.1 million. Last but not least, uh, this is uh, our, grants at a, uh, our grants at a glance. Um, which is a $2.9 million awarded excluding COVID um, uh, SR3. And this is where we are in terms of spending and in our encumbrances. I'll open up for any questions. Any questions? Mr. Shuffman? Yeah, on, on the report you sent us, I've, I, I've got one question. When you go through the budget transfers, and the expended encumbered, you know, the first series going down to page seven at the end, you've got a total. Um, the original budget was 88947334, which is the number we saw on the screen. Now, I'm assuming all the transfers that we've got going on are within uh, the areas that we allow for internal transfers without a vote of the school committee, because I don't, we haven't voted any. Mm -hmm. transfers so, so far these are within the departments yeah these are all within departments mm -hmm. but but my puzzle is is that there's a thousand nine hundred seventy one dollars sort of hanging there with a the revised budget uh increased by that much in column three mm -hmm. so i'm sort of wondering why the original budget and the revised budget numbers differ where the extra thousand nine hundred dollars come from um there is uh an amount that was carried over due to a correction. Um, and I believe that was in the facilities line item. And it's just how uh, the comptroller has the expense entry booked. So when we're running the munis reports, mm -hmm. it's showing the transfer as um, is increasing our revised budget in the current year report versus reflecting is an option to do a carryover report only mm -hmm. is not showing on that it's a it's a booking, it's a booking issue. Uh huh. So it's all munis and comptroller issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Anyone else? <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving on. 
We have the superintendent's update. Right. Okay. So I have a few updates for tonight. We had uh, district wide professional <coughs> learning session two um, yesterday. And those, as a reminder to everybody, is a new model that we started last year. They're choice based professional learning series for all of our paraprofessionals and teachers. The facilitators are this year, this is new, um, doing development and coaching around their course design with Dr. Jill Harrison Bordberg and Dr. Ford Walker. Uh, so that's giving us a little bit more consistency across the courses and how they're designed. Uh, we got feedback. Um, it has continued to be resoundingly positive, and we've heard from facilitators that the vibe changes when people have opted to take a course that you're that you're teaching. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to share that that's ongoing. If you have any more questions about that, I will kick them to um, my right. Central office staffing updates. We are welcoming a number of new staff, and I want to emphasize that we're welcoming a number of new staff, which means we've been a little bit short um, over the last couple of weeks because we've had some vacancies. We have a new engagement and enrollment specialist joining us very soon named uh, Jasmine, a new administrative assistant to the deputy superintendent. Uh, Casey will be joining us uh, as soon as we come back from the holiday break. Um, and soon after that, we're in the middle of interviews for this one, we'll be welcoming a new administrative assistant to the welcome desk who will also who will be serving both the diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging and justice office and the communications and family engagement offices. We're hoping that we'll streamline some protocols for front desk, um, welcome desk uh, procedures in the central office and make it a little more consistent when you come in you see the same smiling face um, and it'll be a little easier for us to buzz people in. So we're working on those entry protocols now. You might've noticed some changes, anybody who visited recently, uh, but everyone will need to be buzzed in and we've got some visitor protocols that we're working on for the front desk. A culture and climate survey update. The family survey has closed. We had record response rates this time higher even than our <laughs> COVID year when we first rolled out the surveys. Um, Thompson and Pierce have tied for the highest response rate for the family survey. <coughs> um, sorry. The student survey is open. Gibbs and OMS are currently in the lead with the student survey responses. The staff survey is open with Thompson in the lead. Um, we are working on a plan to, and um, we've, we've wanted to do this more consistently over the past several years. We finally are, feel like we're in a place where we have the capacity to do so, uh, to release a report of results to all of our community members following a closure of the survey, along with our planned action steps in January and February. We plan to involve the committee in that. <coughs> and have a really clean, easy to read report with some of our reflections and some of the things we hope to do with the data um, for all of you. We've used it a lot internally for planning. You see it in the school improvement plan, so we haven't done a lot of external messaging on this, so we're planning to this time. Um, also, Mr. Coleman has been taking in feedback from across the community to inform the design of future surveys. We're actually meeting next week as an internal team to take a look at that feedback, think about the design of the survey and what changes we might wanna make to future design. Again, this is something we haven't had the capacity to do in the past, but we're really excited that we do now. Um, you have a revised budget request report in your materials. Um, Mr. Mason and I are happy to talk about this. This is, you know, we're moving um, at what feels like a breakneck pace with the budget this year. We were able to meet um, a couple days ago as a cabinet team and do some uh, ranking and discussion of each of the different asks in the budget. You'll notice that some things were taken out that we're pretty sure we can fund through um, other means or redistribution of funds or capital. And then there are other things that we've sort of grouped them by category. Um, the things that we feel we really must, absolutely uh, must fund. There's a large middle category of things that we feel are very aligned with our priorities, very aligned with what Ms. Keyes just shared. Um, you know, we're very much in agreement that we need an uh, influx of technology because we have a lot of aging technology. We need to do some infrastructural improvements that might be tied to capital and that we have a lot of positions that are uh, student facing that are needed in order for us to do more of our inclusion work. So that's a big chunk of that middle section. And then there are more asks that we think are additional needs. Um, and if we can find the dollars for them, great, uh, but we need to prioritize the things that we've said we're gonna prioritize. So that's in your materials. We're happy to take questions about that. And um, there are also this today, uh, the lab annual report was approved and audit report was approved. I don't have the final audit report, but we'll bring that to you in a later update. I do have the annual report finalized and included that in your materials. Um, as a reminder, the lab program is a collaborative on which I serve uh, on the board of directors uh, that we are members of um, it's, uh, communities of Lexington, Arlington, Burlington, Bedford, 
Belmont, and now Watertown. Um, and their <laughs> annual report is there for you to review, and the enrollments are there for you to review. I'll take any questions. Does anyone have any questions? Where's the W going in the lab thing? It's We've talked about <laughs> lob. Um, <laughs> lob. <laughs> What's going on with that? That's a big issue here. For, for right now, the it's not there. It's, it's a topic of discussion. Right no, now. Well, B -B 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 -L, wobble. Yeah. <laughs> it's better We're wobble. kind of the biggest community. We should have a vote. <laughs> we should okay. have a veto. We should um, have a veto. Also, so under. They can't officially change the name without our permission. Can't. Yeah, they can't. Yeah, thank you, <laughs> attorney. Okay. It's in the it's in the opening document. Yeah, right. Okay. Good. So we do have a veto. I'm just kidding. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm actually gonna vote yes. Okay, on folks, that. I'm oh, trying to get this out of here. <laughs> we have I know I've, I've already there, yeah, I know. So, I know. know I've already trashed my record. So <laughs> uh, anyway, under tucked under the superintendent's <laughs> report is Discussion of addition of special school committee meeting on December 21st, 2023. I would hope this could be a Zoom meeting. It would be very quick. It is because we hope to have a contract which we want to have signed or approved. Um, so, uh, can you say the date again? Sorry. Thursday, next day. Next Thursday. 21st. Yeah, next Thursday, a week from today. Mm -hmm. But I think it could it could just be zoom correct mm -hmm. um, and is do you want 630 do you want seven 730 I'd rather have we have a pierce event Thursday night so earlier would be better after it's 4 p.m. please <laughs> if it's a zoom we could I mean if it's a zoom it's a quick vote you could do it earlier mm -hmm. yeah no that's I'm, I'm asking five Five to five. <laughs> five, 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 five. I have a vote that ends at four. Mm -hmm. If that okay. helps you schedule yes. your time. Well, I think I think we'd be okay if, at five. Yes. Mm -hmm. So five sounds okay. Five, yeah. Okay. So can I have a motion to so add moved. a special school committee meeting on Zoom at five for December twenty first? So move. So move. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor. Now, do I have to do roll call no, because we start? All okay. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. So we will add that, and that will be a Zoom meeting. Didn't talk to ACMI, but they can pick it up off of Zoom, so we're good. Okay. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk will be are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. <clears throat> Warrant number 24137, $669,851.16, dated 12-6-23, draft school committee minutes of 11-30-23. So moved. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Yes. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, that's unanimous. And now subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget, Mr. Card. Uh, budget met on Monday. Um, we talked about the enrollment projections, which have already been built into the <coughs> long range plan. Um, the Got an update on the budget development, which we just heard. Um, uh, we went over the fund balances uh, and are expecting um, in the spring a plan for spending down the community education budget, uh, sorry, the community education fund balance, uh, which has been built up to a very high amount. Um, we have one policy revision about when we're getting our monthly, we're not getting monthly reports anymore, we're getting them on a different schedule, so I will send that to you that we approved. I will send that to Paul to handle. Um, we looked at fee rentals for the auditorium and for the Audison bus. Um, it was not, it hasn't been in a superintendent's report, but there was a plan to launch an Audison bus, hopefully uh, early next year. And if we do, um, the fee will end up, since it's only a one-way bus, the fee will be half of what we're charging for the other buses. So that will have to come before us at our next meet, not our, not our special meeting, but our next regular meeting. That's it. Okay. Uh, community relations, Ms. Exxon. Nothing to report. Film <coughs> instruction assessment. Nothing to report. 
Okay. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. Nothing to report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman. Looks like we're meeting on January 24th, a Wednesday at 3 p.m. We have a full agenda. Cool. Uh, Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We, I told you this year, we're, gonna be, we're trying to move the meeting uh, from January 2nd to January 9th uh, because of the holiday. Um, and uh, their tours are taking place at the high school on January 20th, Saturday morning. From nine, 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Mm -hmm. Volunteers are needed. Mm -hmm. Required. We really need <laughs> He help. looked right at me. <laughs> I, I think of everybody. Can be we are looking for volunteers from school committee. It's, you're not walking around. You'll be stationed at one spot and mm -hmm. either direct people or talk about things. Mm -hmm. But it's not hard work. Um, you get effort. service hours credit on the school committee for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a new thing. I just okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a star chart? Yeah, you get a star chart. Yeah. Okay, liaison reports. See none. Oh, Announcement. No, oh, I wait. met with the wellness committee. Um, did you play pinball? We didn't play pinball. We, crikey. <laughs> <laughs> I will need to get back to you with what we discussed. They did a great job. They don't need me. Oh, Mr. Mason was there. We were both. There. <laughs> no, they won't put you yes. on no, the no, no. It was it, anyway. The wellness committee <laughs> has met, meeting our uh, the rice or four time annual statutory requirement to meet, and the people on it who do this work every day were doing a phenomenal job in my estimation. And they're all well. I can't speak to that actually. But. <laughs> okay, with announcement. <laughs> No one. No one has announcements. Future agenda items. Don't see anything. Okay, we now go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if and held if which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective <laughs> bargaining. <laughs> Thank you for the cookies. Um, collective bargaining may also be conducted. Um, and these are to discuss the AEA Unit D negotiations and AEA Unit A negotiations. And we will not be returning from uh, Executive session after we finish. Mm -hmm. So, um, do I have a motion? So moved. moved. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Yes. 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 And I also say yes. So, we are now going into executive session. Mm -hmm.